Uh, my name is TJ De Vrede. I'm the chair of the Infrastructural Consortium. And it's my pleasure to welcome you. And maybe we pass it on to Tom, who also will say a few words of welcome. Good morning. We say in Hawaii, aloha. Aloha. Again, this is the second year that we are doing this doctor consortium, and uh, I'm happy to thank JJ and Bob and uh, the rest of the team who have been spending so much time setting nothing up together. And uh, again, the idea that we are initiating the doctor consortium markets is to uh, prepare the next generation of its leaders. So we hope that uh, by the very fact that you are here today, uh, getting news and getting to know the senior leaders, and sometimes the future that entice you enough motivation and inspiration so that you can sooner rather than later pick up the torch and then run the conference on our behalf. So that is basically the goal of the conference. But on the individual aspect of it, and this is exactly what JJ is going to tell you later on, to would like also to share with you our experience on how we went through this career, which is actually quite exciting, and then try to uh, get you to do the same thing that we have done, but actually even better. And this is basically what I would like to, uh, I would hope that you will be getting experience on this day of the workshop. So with no further ado, I would like again to thank you and thank the DC uh, leaders and the 23 people who are participating to this uh, workshop and you will be invited on Friday uh, the, uh, as a fellow of the Hicks okay, So again, welcome to uh, Kona and then have a good day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Yes, as uh, Tom mentioned, this is a team effort. You can see the co-organizers over here. We kicked this off uh, last year for the first time. Uh, Bob over there, Alan over here. Jason Fetcher really wanted to uh, be here as well, but he's celebrating uh, a lot of foods. In Hong Kong, I noticed on Facebook. Yeah. So it's a matter of uh, priorities, <laughs> I guess. Now, Jason has also been working uh, very hard on this. Um, let's, uh, let's kick this off by uh, explaining a little bit what we are after in this, in this consortium. There are many consortia in, in our field. You, of course, have the ICIS consortium, there's the MSIS consortium, and then in other conferences, they, they also organize their own events. And typically they, uh, they have the same type of flavor. You present your dissertation proposal and you get feedback from faculty on your dissertation research to hopefully help you uh, find some different ways of positioning it or to change a few things. But that's, that's basically it. And it's also a networking event. At the Higgs Consortium, um, that may happen as well, but we're actually after something else. And that is what Tung was mentioning. We're we're here because you have been selected as high potential, as people that can make a difference in the future at Hicks, at other conferences. It's a very popular uh, event. <laughs> um, so we, we are here today to share with you uh, suggestions, ideas about how to position your research, how to maybe turn it into a research program. What do you have to bear in mind when you submit this for publication to a top journal? Um, what did other people do to, to get to the point where, like Tung was saying now, we're, we're the leaders that want to hand over the torch? Uh, because, because to keep this conference viable, you have just committed to coming here the next 10 years every year. <laughs> that's, uh, that's the idea. You didn't know that it wasn't the fine print. <laughs> um, so we are looking at professional growth. This is not so much just focused on your dissertation research as it is focused on your development as a professional academic. Um, looking at uh, publications, uh, there also are opportunities perhaps for re re new research initiatives. Uh, many uh, things that you see at Hicks were born the Hicks before. Because people meet at lunches, they meet at breaks, they meet in, uh, in a presentation during the Q&A, and they start chatting. And I know of no other conference in our 
field where so much creative energy goes around than this one. So I personally plan my next conference at this conference. That's how it typically goes. So seek these opportunities out. You, you uh, hopefully will find that there are some commonalities in your team. Uh, I try to uh, form teams where there are some common themes or common areas of research. So hopefully you find some, uh, some connection with each other. And connect with your mentors. Maybe that are interested in doing something. So uh, look for these uh, initiatives. And then, um, you know, in five, six years time, when we look back, we hope to see your names in the program as a mini track chair, um, as a workshop uh, organizer, uh, as an offer in, in different mini tracks. So we're, we're looking forward to seeing you become a permanent and frequent member of, of our community over there. So that's what we're after. Now, how are we going to do that? Um, here is the, the menu for today. Um, we are of course welcoming uh, at the moment. We will start with an, uh, uh, an opening uh, presentation uh, from Bob on uh, practical science. And he's going to ask you a few questions and share some insights. Then we'll have a, uh, a break. Good morning, hello. Um, and then the group discussion starts. So, as you noticed in the materials that I emailed around, uh, you will be working in a small team, three or four fellows with uh, two mentors. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about it uh, about later, but we, we have two slots for that. There will be lunch in between. Lunch will be here, it's a box lunch, so you can pick it up and, and go wherever. It doesn't have to be in the room. Um, then there is a break. And we will end the formal part of the day with a panel discussion. Um, the panel is uh, basically about a career in academia and some best practices, some tips and tricks. Uh, is it uh, optimistic planning for a career or is it planning for opportunities? So we'll, we'll discuss those type of issues. Um, I also want to forewarn you, um, at the time that the panel starts, you'll notice that all of a sudden your mentors are gone, most of them. That is not because they are sort of done with you, you know, they just can't wait to get up. But there is a meeting uh, of the Higgs board uh, starting at 3. And many of your mentors here are leaders in Higgs and they have to be at that meeting. So the panelists of course will be here, but your mentors uh, will disappear. That's, that's nothing to do with you, but that's just the scheduling. Then we'll uh, wrap up, and tonight there is a reception uh, that is co-sponsored by AIS that is helping us to make this uh, consortium possible. It will be at the big steps down from the lobby. If you go out near, you will see it to the left. Uh, there will be some, uh, some light uh, hors d'oeuvres and uh, drinks. And, and please come there as well. And that's sort of the, the official end of the, of the consortium. So we'll, we'll hang out so there. Okay, the teams. Let's uh, go around the room. I think many people already figured it was a good idea to sit in there at our team's table. Um, if you haven't, it doesn't matter because once we start the team discussions, probably we'll start moving around anyway. Um, but let's make sure that everybody knows who everybody is. So team one, Robert Briggs from San Diego State University and Jay Nunnemaker from Duve, University of Arizona. Team two, Christer Carlson from Finland and Hans Jochen Scholl, University of Washington. Team three, Alan Dennis, Indiana and Katie Joshi, Washington State. Okay, we move on to team four. Roman back. Copenhagen, Stacey Tucker from Baylor. And then team five, Bill, Bill, where are you again? Bill Chismark, University of Hawaii, and Dave. And Dave is our... I'm an affiliate. You're an affiliate. He's our secret ingredient. I'm the only one that actually worked for a I am not an And finally, uh, team six. Uh, that's me and Christian from 
we're sending the first email. So, if you're not yet in your team, that's like I said, no problem. You'll find them uh, when the time is there. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, a few uh, institutions, people, of course, the Higgs Conference. Um, this, this consortium is a no charge event for you, which is uh, pretty special compared to other consortia because normally you have to pay something. So we're very grateful because it really makes the, the threshold very low for people to submit. Um, Higgs is also providing the other amenities that, that we have here. Uh, also, uh, AIS. Uh, when Jason was uh, president of the AIS, he secured uh, uh, the support, and it seems that it's going to be ongoing, so we're very happy about that. Um, but most of all, I think if you have a moment, you should pass by the registration desk and thank Panarina, because um, many of you may not notice this, but us who are organizing things here, uh, it doesn't matter what time of day you send her a question. <laughs> <laughs> this lady doesn't sleep, I think, ever, because she just gets responses and she takes care of everything. If there's an issue, you need a reservation, you need something, she typically is ahead of the game. So everything that uh, you see here that's going well, thank her for that. And of course, Tom, for his vision to make this uh, happening. Okay. Before we then uh, dive into uh, Bob's uh, presentation, uh, let me see if there are any questions or any issues that I may have forgotten. You're excited? Yes. Is that fun? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Some of you may be a little bit jet like, I don't know. Uh, who, is, who is furthest away? I know some people here from Germany. Anyone anybody further than Germany? Finland. Finland. India. Yeah. Hong yeah. Kong. Australia. We have two people from Australia, right? Yeah, where's the other? Okay, the person maybe is the jet lag. That's why last night that you got the reception. And thank you, by the way, to Alan for hosting our reception last night. That was. Uh, Welcome, nice to see you. I'm Bob. And um, yeah, I wanted I wanted to tell you a little bit about how you were selected. When we when we set up the consortium, what we were looking for was people with ideas that had a high potential for real world impact. And that is in keeping with the traditions of Hicks. At Hicks, we will accept an interesting paper that's working on an interesting problem that hasn't yet achieved elements of 105 over another paper that has a very high statistical significance, but is working on some trivial little idea. Yes, you know, your research is impeccable, but the likelihood of real world impact is low. So it is that tradition at Hicks that, that great ideas come here, are born, and are developed, and then some years later they wind up at ISIS and when they're about ready for publication in journals and so on. So that, that, that was our primary selection criteria. And so you're here because saw in your work this potential for high potential for real world impact. And we thought it was, it was uh, a good idea to invite you to Hicks because this is the place where those kinds of ideas are fostered and, and you, here's where you'll find a community of researchers who are interested in doing that kind of thing with you. So welcome. I came across this really interesting um, uh, piece of work a little while back, uh, the scientific self-aptitude assessment models. And it's a good way to figure out where you fit in, where you, you and your work fit in. So I thought we, we might open with this. Okay, there's this person who pulls on a lever and gets hit by lightning. Okay, and then they're contemplating what happened. Can you see, by the way, my blocking him? This is a good place for me to be. Um, okay, now a normal person would say, um, I guess I shouldn't do that. And the scientist said, says, I wonder if that happens every time. <laughs> so if you find yourself over here, you're in the right place. <laughs> That's who we are. You can tell by the lightning burns coming gas. Okay. But there is this question of where does your research fit in? We're all about doing 
uh, high impact research, research that makes a difference that matters in the real world. So, but there's more to it than that. There are some, there are some disciplines of science. There are some, some, some well thought through uh, ways of thinking and ways of working. There's bodies of logic that are helpful to us. And your research is going to fit into one or more of those forms of thinking. And therefore, the more you know about those forms of thinking, the easier it's going to be for you to make a real world impact. So I thought I would share some thoughts with you. These are things that, by the way, I didn't know when I graduated with my degree. I had just these vague understandings. I didn't know how the pieces fit together. So I thought I would offer you some sense of, of what I've learned over the years. First off, we can think about our research at a very high level in terms of its epistemological positioning. Now, there is a myth that these epistemological approaches are, are things that we are. Oh, I'm an interpretivist. I'm a criticalist. I'm a, I'm a, a causal inquirer. Um, and in fact, these things are not religions. These things are tools that we use. And in my research, I use logic from all of these three forms of epistemology. And epistemology is a general approach to a certain set of questions, a useful, disciplined approach. And with interpretivism, we can get at questions of meaning. I put out a solution to a group of military leaders, and they refused to use it. Why? Because it made them, they said, look like they were panicking. It had involved lots of, lots of rapid action and transferring of papers. They said, no, that makes us look like our hair's on fire. We will demoralize the people we lead if we behave that way. That was a question of meaning that I could never have gotten to if I was looking at questions of cause and effect. Then we have questions of um, axiology, questions of good, bad, right, wrong, and these would be questions of aesthetics, of, uh, of, of, of ethics, morals, and social justice. So there is a whole body of different way of getting answers to these questions and separating the things we know from the things that we only suspect or hope. Okay. And then the, the third of the currently prevailing epistemologies is, is causal inquiry. And causal inquiry addresses questions of cause and effect. Now, again, in my research stream, I'm using this constantly, but in any given study, I'm going to need to know which of the, which of the pre prevailing epistemologies I need to position my, my paper. I need to position my paper, and I need to know the disciplines I'm going to use so that when I position my paper, I can argue and demonstrate that it's in fact rigorously conducted as I'm going after this high world impact in my research. Okay. Now, I'm going to focus most of this talk on causal inquiry, because that's where I am, and, and that's where I'm deeply trained and read. And in your career, I hope you also encounter people who are deeply trained and read on criticalism, and people who are deeply trained and read on interpretivism. And I have learned a great deal from people like that, and I, all of which I use in my own research when I come across questions of meaning and questions of ethics or social justice. So, but scientific method, the classic science, there is a myth that, uh, that classic science can't be used with people. It turns out that, that the logic of, of scientific inquiry holds regardless of whether you're studying quarks and neutrinos or things that people do and use. For what, there, are, there are issues of cause and effect that we can look at. And the, the uh, goals of scientific method, it has, it has four, uh, four modes of inquiry. There's exploratory research, which has as its goal to discover and describe phenomena. We have theoretical research, which has as its goal to discover, uh, sorry, to uh, create causal models to explain and then predict the values of the phenomena that interest us. We have experimental research, which has as its goal to test the usefulness of the causal theories that we create to explain and then predict uh, the phenomena of interest. And then we have, lastly, applied science engineering research, or so applied science research or engineering research in different countries. It's called uh, different things, so I'll put them both in there for now. Um, which has as its goal to use scientific knowledge and scientific methods to solve practical problems, to address major real world issues, to make a difference that matters in the field. Okay. So the question that I'd like to put to you today as I work through these four modes of inquiry, is where does your research, the paper you brought today, and your general stream of research, where does it fit? Is it exploratory? Is it theoretical? Is it experimental? Is it ASC? That's my abbreviation for applied science engineering research, by the way. Um, design science research, uh, action research, uh, 
what, a, action design research, uh, IS design research, and so on. These are all instances and prescriptions for approaches to conducting applied science and engineering research. So they are, they are all useful approaches. Let's start quickly with, with exploratory research. Okay? In science, it, it has, a, in a little more detail, its goal is to discover and describe phenomena and their correlates and the context and conditions under which they manifest. And I've got to tell you, if you don't add this to your reports of your findings, this has no value at all. If you told me, oh, I discovered this correlated to that, under what conditions? I don't remember. I got nothing I can do with that. But if we know the context and conditions of your explorations, eventually over time we'll begin to see enough clues that at some point we'll be able to make that creative, intuitive leap to a theoretical explanation for the seemingly conflicting things that we discover in our exploratory research. So we want to look at phenomena, correlates, and the context and conditions under which they manifest. In the field, because we are IS, and we are actually trying to make a difference that matters in the field, we are an applied discipline. We use exploratory research, for example, to discover and describe the important classes of unsolved problems in the field. We, use, we can use the disciplines of exploratory research to do this, and then we can publish our problem statements as exploratory contributions. We also use exploratory research to, to um, test the efficacy, the usefulness of our IS solutions that were informed by intuition. It's so often the case that if somebody makes the intuitive leap to a, a new technology, a new approach to design, you know, to, to requirements negotiation, it, it didn't like come out well. I, I have all these theories, I shall now reason my way to a solution. It often doesn't come that way. It comes as an inspiration. That's legitimate science. But we can test those efficacy of those things that are not informed by theory with exploratory research. Okay. Now, I mentioned phenomena, I mentioned correlates. And I gotta tell you, I was 15 years into my career before I, maybe more, before I figured out what a phenomenon was, or read somebody who had figured it out and explained it to me. So what do I mean by phenomenon? Well, I'm gonna give it to you this way, see how this works. In the universe, I'm gonna start with the universe, talking about phenomena. In the universe, there are things, like for example, these things, right? Guitars and cowboy boots and, uh, and people and, and quarks. In the universe, there are things. Things have properties. Like, for example, here's a thing that has these properties, names, ages, weight, volume, height, smell, permeability, etc. I conjecture that it may be, it's possible, I don't have any way to back this up yet, but I conjecture that it may be that any given object in the universe has an infinite variety of properties, and that they may only be limited by our creative ability to notice them. I'm not positive of that, but it's an interesting point. But we're not interested in all of them. We're only interested in certain ones that are relevant to improve the outcomes that we, uh, that we want to uh, do with our, with our information systems. Okay, in the universe there are things, things have properties, Prop properties have values. For example, this is Psy, um, Gang Gangnam Stock, right? Uh, he's, uh, at the time I wrote this up, he was 36, 174 pounds, he, his volume was 21 gallons, he's five foot seven. Can he smell? Yes, he can smell. Uh, permeability was 8%. This made that up. Fake science. Fake science. Um, but the point is, in the universe there are things, things have properties, and those properties have values. And by the way, those values, we call those data. Okay. Sometimes the, uh, we observe that the value of property of a thing varies over time and conditions. That's a phenomenon. Every time we see a certain property that has a different value than it had somewhere else where we might have seen it, that's a phenomenon. It's the value of the property of a thing that we observe to vary across time and conditions. That's a phenomenon, right? Yesterday he was smaller, today he's bigger. Hmm, that's funny. Why does that happen? The phenomenon is the beginning of science, the phenomenon is the core of science all the way through. So it's really important to understand what a phenomenon is because everything else we do depends on that understanding. And the problem we have is that uh, there are other things that masquerade as phenomena that aren't. We'll get into that in a moment. Okay, so in science, a phenomenon is, is an observed variation in the value of a property of a thing. What does it look like to us as IS researchers when we're, when we're in the field? Well, 
The phenomena that we get interested in are the outcomes that we seek to improve. Our problem statements are defined. The values of these phenomena are unacceptable. And we have to do exploratory research to figure out which are the values, which are the phenomena whose values are unacceptable that define our problem, which are the phenomena that are involved in the constraints on solutions, like cognitive load and the amount of money on hand. Okay? These same phenomena then become the phenomena that we use to define our, our design goals. Because if, if, um, if user satisfaction is too low, then we have a design goal to design a solution that is not only producing the desired effect, but also satisfies. So these same phenomena that define our problem define our design goals. And they also therefore design our, our, the, our foundation for our metrics for success. Is our new information system producing the desired effect? Well, we have to go back to our problem statement, to our design goals, and there we are. So these phenomena, when we're doing ASC research, where we're using science and scientific method, scientific knowledge and scientific methods, to solve a practical problem in the field, those are our phenomena of interest. These outcomes, these measurable outcomes. Okay. Here's some examples of things that I've had to work with in my research in the field. Value, create, uh, creativity, consensus, satisfaction, willingness to change, completeness of requirements. These are just examples of phenomena. These are values and problems of a thing. And I can tell you, <coughs> each in each case, what is this value? Consensus is a property of a particular thing. Creativity is a property of a mind, a particular individual. Uh, willingness to change, that's an individual, a state of mind of an, of an individual, and so on. So the research begins and ends with phenomena. So the question, the first question to you is always going to be, what are your phenomena of interest? What are the values and problems, what values of what properties of which particular specific kinds of objects are the focus of your research? Here are some things that are not phenomena, that masquerade as phenomena. And when you accidentally get one of these into your theoretical and experimental research, the craziest things happen. It can be 10 years before you, 10 years of <coughs> research before you finally discover what the real problem is. Okay? Okay. Quality of, and then filled with the right quality of software, quality of user experience, quality of information, quality of anything that is not a property of a thing. Not a property of a thing. The success of project systems training, success is not a property of a thing. It's a classification of a thing. It's a post hoc classification or assessment of a thing. Leadership style. Leadership style is not a property of a leader. Leadership style is a classification of a set of behaviors. And it is not a phenomenon. And therefore, these all of these things are, are derived attributes. You've been in databases. Remember derived attribute. These are actually things, conclusions that we reach, assessments that we ascribe, classifications that we ascribe that are based on the values of the properties of the things we are classifying or assessing. And it's those underlying properties that are the focus of our science. If we try to build a theory to explain success or to explain quality or to explain the, the leadership style, our 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 we are going to inevitably crash on the shoals of research that becomes increasingly more and more complex. And eventually, in every, in every literature I've looked for, I've found a paper that says this, this, this phenomenon is just too complex to study with scientific inquiry. All we can do is just watch it and describe it. There's a paper like that in our literature from 1990. And the problem is that, that we, we mistook a, a uh, uh, derived attribute for a, a phenomenon. Okay, so there we go. So I mentioned that the goal of, uh, of uh, exploratory research is to discover and describe phenomena and their correlates. I think you probably have a better understanding of correlate, but just for the sake of completeness. It's other phenomena that we observe whose values seem to co-vary with our phenomena of interest. Either when this one goes up, that one's also up, or when this one's up, that one's down, and vice versa. Okay, so we're looking for phenomena and their correlates. And by the way, when we report them in, we report the correlations as, under the conditions of this study, we observe this kind of correlation. Because any time you discover a correlation in the field, I give you 98% probability that I can find a different set of conditions where the correlation doesn't happen. Right? 
So uh, we also we, we report the correlations and the conditions under which we observe them. It's really important. In practice, of course, the important classes of unsolved problems in the field are often uh, analyzed in terms of what what correlate. What are the things that seem to correlate with our with our outcomes of interest, the measurable outcomes of interest that we're trying to improve. Those would be the correlates, and those are going to become the focus then of our, of our exploratory and theoretical and experimental uh, research. Okay, and the correlates uh, are often uh, things that, get, that we, we start paying attention to when we're testing our solutions that are informed by intuition. So here are some of the research products you can produce if you want to publish some things. Here are some of the things you can produce when you're using exploratory research. You can re uh, produce uh, reports of variations and correlations among phenomena in the contexts that you observe them. Great detail. We need great detail in the context and conditions. Storytelling, because that, as I said, it gives us the clues later to theorize about why we saw a certain relationship under this set of conditions, but saw something completely different under that set of conditions. Another contribution you make is, is, is constructs. In the context of this talk, a construct only has one meaning. I mean, the term has many meanings in science, but today it just means one thing. A construct is a, is a named and rigorously defined phenomenon. I'll get into the rigor of the definition in, in a minute. Another, uh, another probably one of the highest contributions we can make to exploratory science is grounded theory. And by the way, that term grounded theory, like every other term I've used today, is used by other people to mean something different. Every term in science is heavily overloaded. In the context of this talk, grounded theory is a model of observed associations where you can discover some patterns of correlation that are so regular that you can, you can put them into a predictive model. TAM, for example, is a great example of grounded theory. It's not a causal theory. It's a grounded theory. It's a model of observed correlations. But those grounded theories are the strongest clues we get that help, that help us lead into the logic of a causal theory. In the field, of course, the contributions are going to, these contributions, when we're doing our ASC research, using a sport for research, we're going to contribute problem statements, best practices, evaluations of solutions, and so on for exploratory research. The standards of rigor. Each of these four modes of inquiry has some standards of rigor that keep us on track and with which we can argue the merits of our research. And say, my research conforms to this, therefore, you know, publishing at MISQ. First off, the, all of our phenomena have to be defined as constructs with definitions that are explicit. They have to be sufficiently specific that we can distinguish them from other closely related constructs. For example, I started working in satisfaction research, and I didn't know when I started satisfaction research that there were three closely related constructs that we call satisfaction. One of them is an emotion, one of them is a judgment, I judge that my needs have been satisfied, and one of them is an attitude. And they're all called satisfaction, and they're all closely related, and they are three different constructs, three very different phenomena with different causes and different relationships to other things. So we have to make our definition sufficiently specific, we can tell the difference. Another thing we do is in, uh, in exploratory research is validation through concatenation, which means, hey, I report, I discovered that uh, under these conditions, satisfaction correlated, correlated with uh, productivity. That the users were more productive under, uh, you know, the more productive users were most satisfied. Somebody else then publishes another study and says, well, under these conditions, the most productive users were least satisfied, and the least productive users were most satisfied. That is not a, a, a disconfirmation of the first piece of work. This is not a theory that we're trying to test, you know, to see whether the theory predicts across all conditions. These are observed things that happen in what we So they don't conflict, they happen. Under these conditions, this seem to hold, under those conditions, this other thing happens. And then eventually we get to theoretical science and we say, wait a minute, hey, I had a theory that can explain why that happened differently under different conditions. So we do our validation in exploratory research through concatenation, where we, we investigate the same phenomenon and relationships under varying conditions and report what we find up to the point of conceptual saturation. When we got to the 473rd study of TAM, which said, yep, these things still seem to correlate, We've got conceptual saturation. We're not adding anything new to the literature when we do the 474th. 
So at some point when we reach conceptual saturation and we're not finding anything new about these, these phenomena and their, and their correlates, it's time to move on. And the, but here's the most important standard of rigor for exploratory research by far. Strict adherence to the language of correlation. There is no logic in science by which we can impute causality to impute to observed correlations. No logic by which we can impute causality to observed correlations. And yet, the human mind instantly imputes causality to observed correlations. If you don't believe it, look at all the great exploratory research in the IF literature, which is published with causal language, impacts and uh, influences and, uh, well, we'll get there. Let me, let me demonstrate how co correlation is not causation. 100% of the days that I observed people wearing Hawaiian shirts, it was sunny outside. Yesterday it snowed, so I went in and put on my Hawaiian shirt to warm things up. No, that's silly. That's silly. It's obvious that that's silly. But that's what happens when we impute causality to observe correlation. It doesn't, it's not so easy to see when you're writing a scholarly paper. This is out of a real paper. This paper investigates how vendor-specific investments affect, there's that causal language, vertical coordination between, three, between firms. That's as silly as saying I put on my shirt to bring the sun out. And yet it doesn't look that silly. But it is. This was an, ex an exploratory piece. There was no logic by which to impute causality to those observed correlations. It's at least equally possible that people make vendor-specific investments because they are doing vertical coordination. That's why they make the investments. It's also possible that some third thing is influencing both vertical coordination and better specific investments. So the natural thing, in fact, it happens so 100% of the time that I can't not do it. I recently tried to write up an example of a not causal statement, and I had to delete it three times because three times I wrote a causal statement when I was trying not to. The fourth time I did it word by word and I got it. But the standard of rigor is that we excise, we, we go back and scrape out all the causal language from our exploratory research, okay? Because we don't want to publish these upside down statements. Okay, so if A and B, B are observed to correlate, it may be that A causes B, it may be that B causes A, it may be some unknown C causes both A and B. We have no idea. And it may be that it's just random chance. They just happen to correlate that day, just at random. All right, so here's the language we need. A correlates with B, it's associated with, with, with uh, B. A is related to B, G is, related. G is predicts H. If you have a, a very strong correlation that shows up across a lot of conditions, you can say, well, if I know the value of G, I can predict the value of H. That's the strongest claim we can make, and it is not a causal claim, and we have to eliminate any language from our exploratory research that connotes causality, influences, effects, impacts, determines. I've built myself a list of about 20 terms that I've used myself and discovered the papers that I've reviewed that I, that I constantly have to go back and scrape out of my own work. In fact, I now do word searches at the end of my paper when I'm ready to submit. I go do word searches to scrape out causal language from my exploratory papers and replace it with correlates, associates, or relates. And it makes the paper so much more valuable because as soon as you put in causal language, somebody's going to try and refute it. And they can't refute it. It's not refutable. You saw what happened. You measured it. You reported it. This is not a test of a theory. We're not trying to falsify a theory. We're trying to report that under these conditions, this relationship happened. And if people are trying to refute your exploratory research instead of concatenating it, it blocks science. It slows us down. So your paper becomes powerful and much more likely to make an impact when you you deny yourself the, the, uh, the temptation to put in causal language in your exploratory research. Because there is no logic in exploratory <coughs> research by which we can impute causality to observe correlation. No, just don't do it. <laughs> right? Don't go there. All right, so that's exploratory research. Quick tour. So where does your research fit in? Is it exploratory? 
it might be easier to understand whether it's exploratory when you, you can take a look at this uh, approach to theoretical research. Okay? The goals of theoretical research in science are to create models of cause and effect that explain and then predict um, the, uh, the values of the phenomena of interest. And for us, of course, the phenomena of interest are the ones that define our problem space. These values are, are too high. These values are too low. And I, I know that uh, Gregor and Jones, uh, or Shirley Gregor, in her great paper on kinds of theory, she talks about predict and explain. But in fact, when you're doing a causal theory, it works the other way. First you explain, and then once you've got the explanation, you can predict the most remarkable things. Okay. So we're going to predict and explain what? The observed variations and phenomena from our, from our exploratory research. We're going, to, we're going to predict, explain the correlations that we've observed. In practice, we want to use this kind of logic and this kind of thinking to predict that we're going to see predicts and explains that I did it the other way again. That predicts or explains the effects of our design choices. That's why we want theoretical logic, we want sound theory wherever we can get it. Because if we have a sound theory, we can say, hey, if I designed it this way, then ought to be that for reasons better outcome on the phenomena that I care about. Now, quick example, early in my career, uh, a colleague uh, had a, a user interface for a particular uh, tool that he, he was, it was, it was measuring the performance of the, of the uh, users and giving them feedback on the performance and nothing was happening. It was a graph that showed what their productivity looked like. Nothing was happening. And he said that the literature shows that you get what you measure and we're measuring them and tell them about it and management literature shows it. So they should be, they should be, uh, Responsible. We should be getting higher productivity. We're not. And I, th I had just come across a theory called social comparison theory. And I said, well, if the theory holds, we ought to be able to draw a single horizontal line across the interface. And that should produce the effect you want. And so we, we, we built a version of it that had that horizontal line, and we got a 30% boost in productivity. Now, without that theory, I never would have thought to draw that one line there. It was on the graph, and all we did was we drew that one line and we labeled it performance of the average group. It was a group, it was a group brainstorming tool. What we know about Americans, Americans don't want to be below average. You, know? you don't get what you measure, you get what you motivate. And one of the ways we motivate by rewarding things that we measure, but there was no reward for that. Until we said, well, you don't want to be below average to do that. So that's what I mean by using the theory to inform design choices. Social comparison theory says that, that, that people would be, be motivated to um, motivated to make effort to the extent that they tend to match the level of effort to the people around them. We gave them a mythical group to, to compare to. Okay, so uh, the logic that, so in practice, it's the logic that uh, predicts and explains the effects of our design choices. Uh, good theory can, ex can can uh, suggest counterintuitive design choices like that horizontal line and uh, can account for our successes and failures. We don't always have that theory available, which means as, as ASC researchers, sometimes we have to develop new theory. Products of theoretical research, causal theories, composed, which are composed of three kinds of statements, axioms, boundary assumptions, and propositions. Quick look at an axiom. An axiom is, uh, I'm going to offer a quick example of the theory, uh, which is uh, meant to explain and predict user productivity in a system. So what if we were to assume, an axiom is, by the way, is a, some, an axiom assumes a causal mechanism, some mechanism in the universe that might be causing the effect we're trying to explain. What if we were to assume axiom one, human attention resources are limited, and you can't think about everything at once. I'm trying to explain user productivity, okay? And what if, uh, and, well, the boundary condition, this, this theory is only going to uh, apply when the kind of productivity people are doing um, requires attention. So if people are, uh, if we assume attention resources are, are limited, and people, we assume people are, are working under conditions um, where uh, productive effort requires attention, then it would have to be. Now we get to, so that, those are axioms, that's an axiom, it's an assumption, it's got a, a mental mechanism which includes limited attention resources. And that leads me then to a causal proposition. A causal
causal proposition is derived by deductive logic from my axiomatic assumption. If I assume people have limited attention resources, and I'm trying to explain productivity, okay, then I can derive this functional statement of cause and effect from my axiomatic assumption. Okay? And it looks like this. If axiom one, human attention sources are limited, and if, of course, my boundary assumption that productive effort does require attention, then it would have to be, by deductive logic, proposition one, a functional statement of cause and effect, user productivity have to be an inverse function of distraction. People have limited attention resources and their productivity depends on attention, or consumes attention, then the more I distract them, the less productive they're gonna be. Illustrate that this way, distraction. If productivity is an inverse function of distraction, the higher the distraction, the lower the productivity. Now what does that mean for my design choices? What does that mean for my design choices? When I take it into the practical applied science engineering research, I can say, well, if proposition one, productivity is an inverse function of distraction, then I should be able to prove user productivity by A, eliminating distractions from the system, or using the system to mitigate distractions in the environment. And now, this, this theoretical logic has led me to some, some design strategies. So that's the nature of causal logic. I'll make these slides available, get, get them posted out to you if you want to go back and look at this. I know this is a, a fast pass through. All right, standards of rigor for a causal, ca a causal theory. Uh, we will falsify and believe our constructs, and, uh, and that means that our constructs are defined, the definitions of our constructs are sufficiently specific that we can separate them from the other closely related constructs, which by the way is not a trivial task and the falsifiability of our propositions. First off, our propositions have to be derived from the axiomatic assumptions. A proposition on its own is not a theory. Not, it's not a causal theory, it's a model of observed correlation. Until I derive some causal relationship based on an axiomatic assumptions, I don't yet have a causal theory. And it's not tautological. It's not true by definition or based on circular reasoning. My favorite tautological uh, proposition of all was one that I came across. The number of, of uh, defects in the code are a function of the number of mistakes made by the programmers. That's, that's a tautology. That's what I mean by tautology. Duh, that's true by definition. That's circular logic, you know. They're not all so easy to see as that. I have myself on a number of occasions wandered into tautology and, and uh, got great results for a while. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is embarrassing. All right, the criteria for a theoretical contribution, first off, explanatory power. Does your new theory explain more of the observed variations than the old theory? Parsimony. Does the new theory require fewer axioms, constructs, and relationships than the old theory? If so, it's a better theory because the goal of the theory is to help me predict and explain fewer things I have to think about to, to be able to predict and explain better that theory, more useful that theory is and generalizability. Does the new theory apply across a wider variety of context than the old theory? My theory of user productivity is bounded. It's not universal. It only applies to places where productivity requires attention. If I could come back with a general theory of productivity, it would apply to any effort. So those are, the, those are some of the key criteria for a theoretical contribution. Experimental research. You can hear a lot about experimental research, so I'm going to kind of breeze through this one. This one's much better uh, explained uh, in, in, our, in our domain. Many people understand it. The goal is to test the proposition of a causal theory, period. This is the part where I didn't know when I was a student. That's it. That's the only purpose of the experiment, is to test the causal proposition, proposition from a causal theory, period. Now, I want to note, though, that experimental techniques, which are not the same as experimental research, experimental techniques, which use all the same sort of techniques and methods and everything as an experiment, are useful in exploratory research, and they're useful in ASC. But when we use the techniques to do something other than test the proposition of a causal theory, we cannot impute causality to the findings. We can only say we have discovered a relationship. Still a fantastic way to go after discovering and, and describing 
some, some relationship among constructs. But you can't impute causality to it except when you're testing the proposition of a causal theory. So you report it without any causal language. You can say it correlates with, is related to, and so on. The key discipline of experimental research is deriving a hypothesis. And it's important to know what a hypothesis is. It has a specific structure, and once you understand that structure, it makes your work so much easier. And again, I tell you this because I didn't understand this very exactly. So let me save you a trip. OK, a hypothesis is first and foremost a comparative statement. It contrasts the value of a dependent variable. By the way, the dependent variable is the one I choose to for that causal construct. Like distraction, my causal construct was distraction. Sorry, I said that completely backwards. We want to be not okay? okay. <laughs> the dependent variable measures the consequent construct, the effect, the thing we care about, our phenomena of interest measures that. So we're going to contrast the value of a dependent variable across at least two treatments comprising the independent variable. And the independent variable manipulates the value. The causal construct manipulates the cause. I want to do one treatment that has a high distraction and another treatment with low distraction. So that's what it is. It's a comparative statement that contrasts the value of the dependent variable across, across at least two treatments comprising an independent variable. And that's enough for me. But once you understand that, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. For example, if proposition one, productivity is an interest function of distraction, then brainstorming groups with round and pounding on the wall should produce fewer unique ideas than brainstorming groups with no pounding on the walls. This is a comparative statement, right? It compares the number of unique ideas that groups perform across at least two treatments. Here we go. Round and pounding on the walls, there's treatment one. And there's treatment two. Well, that, across at least two treatments that manipulate the value of the causal construct. Quick tour through theoretical research, sorry, experimental research. Now, products of experimental research are hypotheses, experimental designs and methods, validated metrics. You often find papers that figured out, somebody's figured out a great way to measure a certain phenomenon of interest and get it out there. Um, analyze data sets, empirical support for, or refutation of theories. Those are the things we can produce from our experimental research. Standards of rigor, our hypotheses, for example, have to be derived from the theoretical proposition by deductive logic. If the, if the hypothesis is derived from pre previous reports of observed correlations, you're using experimental research to do uh, techniques to do exploratory research and publish it with no causality. The only place you're entitled to impute causality is when you have used an experiment to test the proposition of a causal theory. That's the only place in science we can do it. And then there are, there are volumes written on, ex on experimental validity, construct validity, internal validity, statistical validity, external validity. And I encourage you to say this from Campbell on experimental quasi experimental research. I'm not going to go through that now. But the key thing to recognize, the thing that I didn't recognize when I didn't know when I started, is that an experiment's purpose is to test the theory. When you're doing experimental research, but well, we can use those same techniques <coughs> in exploratory research, but we don't impute causality to the results. That was the main thing I wanted to drive home. So the hypotheses are derived in the experimental validity, validity in its many forms are, I've been adhered to, the analysis supports the hypothesis, and the literature isn't already saturated with replications. So, final, uh, final one is, now we're coming home, this is us. Applied science engineering research. The goal of uh, applied science engineering research is to use scientific knowledge and scientific methods to discover and solve important classes of unsolved problems in the field, practical problems. What do we mean by use scientific knowledge and scientific methods? We mean use exploratory research, theoretical research, and experimental research, either what you find in the literature or what you do yourself. And it's very likely when you're working on a major real world issue, some of that science isn't going to be in the literature. Otherwise, somebody else would have already solved this issue. It wouldn't be a major real world issue anymore which means you're going to have to know how to do to be a great IS researcher. You're going to have to have some uh, work with colleagues or master yourself the disciplines of exploratory, theoretical, and experimental research. And you bring them to bear to solve these major real world issues, chunk by chunk, until at the end of your career you can say, here we go, we got it. We 
got it. Okay, so the products that we can produce out of ASC research, important classes of unsolved problems. If you are the one who, who produces the empirical report that demonstrates there is this major class of, of uh, problems which has not yet been solved, we ought to be addressing that's an MISQ of JMIS paper. And it's going to take a ton of work to do that. Uh, generalizable requirements are the requirements that any solution to the problem, no matter what the approach, is going to have to, going to, going to, have to meet these requirements. No matter if you do it on paper or your technology or you know, AI, whatever approach you're taking, you're going to have to still meet these requirements. A generalizable solution is one that can be applied in the many places where that problem manifests. It's not just one local solution to one local problem. No, it's a generalizable solution. Spreadsheets are generalizable solution for creating a mathematical model. It applies in accounting, it applies in physics. You know. It's a generalizable solution. Validated expository instances, prototypes. Expository instances, Gregor and Jones, 2007. Could say prototypes. Validated, that means I've actually tested them in the field and demonstrated that they improve the outcomes of interest, the phenomena of interest that we've been trying to improve. Design theories. A design theory is a body of knowledge that practitioners can use everything they need to know to create their own instance of your generalizable solution. And a design theory is not something you're going to be able to produce when you've got your first, when your first proof of concept prototype. It's going to come at the end of a long stream of research where you can proof of value, sorry, proof of concept, and then proof of value, taking it into people, taking it into the field and demonstrating it creates value and proof of use, which means people have now adopted it the thing apart from the research and they're getting value out of what you've taken your hands off. A design theory is not a small thing. It's not a fit on one page. It's not a diagram. It's a whole body of knowledge. Systems analysis and design, for example, is a design theory for information systems. Not something you're going to put on one slide or one page of paper. It's at the end of a, a long stream of research. So standards of rigor for ASC has to be addressing an important class of problems. The solution has to be novel generalizable, and empirically validated. Criteria for a contribution, if you have, uh, it does address a, a, an important pot, class of problems. I think this is redundant, move on. Worth reading, worth reading. I, I encourage you to read Robert Stebbins on exploratory research. It's a 60 page book from Sage. It set me free. <coughs> I had conducted and thrown away so much exploratory research in my career because I didn't know that it was published. I didn't know the standards of rigor. So check out Stebbins. Karl Popper on the logic of scientific discovery. I never was able to get through more than five pages a day at Popper. Sometimes it was only one page. But get at least through the hundred pages, the first hundred pages of that book. And uh, make sense out of what he's saying. Say just Cook and Campbell on experimental and Hefner and Chatterjee on design science. These are all worth reading. All right, so there it is. How did I do? Oh, 1,300. My time. So, questions, comments? It's it. I just covered centuries of philosophy of science in 45 minutes. So. Um, how are boundary conditions that you mentioned in theoretical research? Yeah, boundary assumptions. Well, here's the thing. There are theories, and when we, there, a theory, the theory starts typically small and limited. It can explain, a call, you get a call to the theory, and it can explain some variations in the phenomenon, not all of them, but under some set of conditions. But it's not yet general. Albert Einstein even went through this. His first theories to explain the universe only explained the universe where, where time was assumed to be constant. Where, the, where, sorry, where speed was assumed to be constant. His, his early formulas couldn't explain what happened when you were accelerating or decelerating. And it couldn't explain rotations and all kinds of things it couldn't explain. So he had to say, he had to have this boundary assumption on his early work that says uh, constant motion, constant speed. And his formulas only worked in cases where it was constant speed. So he had to, he had to publish with his theory um, by the way, this only applies under these conditions, constant speed. That's a boundary assumption. If we assume constant speed, these, these formulas explain and predict all these things about the universe. Later, he got his 
general theory of relativity. That's a special theory because it only applied under special conditions. His general theory applied regardless of what the rates of motion were. And, uh, and so it had no boundary conditions, no boundary assumptions. Does that help? Uh, oh, you were talking about the oh, context, context and conditions. Yeah. Context and conditions. Um, context and conditions go like this. Let's go back to the, the distraction. <coughs> when I, when I set up a, a situation where people were brainstorming on this computer using this software with this problem under these, these, following these instructions for this many minutes, I observed that when, when I pounded on the walls, they were less productive than when I had them in a quiet room. If they were just random poundings that came up, you know, every, every 30 to 90 seconds, they produced fewer ideas under those conditions. Now, under, and, and under these conditions, when I had these people working on, as a group, on using this particular set of collaboration technology configured in just this way, on this particular problem, with the tools configured in this way, we observed that the most productive teams were the least satisfied. And the least productive teams were the most satisfied. Under other conditions, when we had a different problem and different teams, and different, a different configuration of the tool and different instructions, we observe that the most productive people were the most satisfied and the least productive people were the least satisfied. So that's the, that's the context and conditions. Exactly what was going on, who was doing what, what tools were they using, what instructions were they giving, any detail that might possibly have any relevance at all to the outcome is described. So when we're doing our exploratory research, we are, we are meticulous in our reports of the details of what was happening. At the time, we observed a correlation between a couple of constructs or observed variations in a particular construct. First, we discover and describe variations. Later, we go, oh, wait a minute, look. When that one gets big, this one's getting little. Oh, there's a correlation there, and we report that. Under these conditions, under the conditions that I described for my study, I observed this. And, th and then you might follow up, you might concatenate, but you know, I try to repeat his, what he would point, try to, I try to, repeat his conditions, and here's everything that I did, and under those conditions, which were as close as I could get to what he wrote, I observed a different relationship. Now, there's an interesting thing that makes us go, gee, that's funny. Why was it under that conditions, under that study, it happened, and under what looks on the paper to be the identical conditions, it didn't happen. That means there's something else we haven't yet discovered. Anytime you, you, some, something happens, it makes you go, gee, that's funny. That's the three most exciting words in science because you're standing on the brink of the discovery. It's like, whoa, there's something going on here. We have no idea. What is it? What is it? Where is it? You go digging deeper, go looking. Thank you. Yeah. Oftentimes we hear this uh, in a for paper, this explanatory. Um, oh, you use it. Explanatory or explanatory? I mean, explanatory. Explanatory, yes. Uh, you have these correlation model, uh, and models and you claim causality. This is all, and then choose your word, like BS or something like that. It, well, it's, it's, um, it's uh, fatally flawed reports. <coughs> it really is <coughs> in the exciting exploratory research, but it, it picks up a fatal flaw when you put in causality. It slows down the science. Um, it doesn't explain anything. It predicts. It doesn't explain anything. And again, if you're deriving your hypotheses from other people's observed correlations, well, so and so reported close, so I, my hypothesis one is that I'm going to get the same thing. You're not doing an experiment, you're doing ex exploration. And it's exciting. We need a ton of good exploratory, rigorous exploratory research before we can ever get enough insight to make that intuitive leap to a theory. What could be the causal mechanisms that would explain all these different variations and correlations that we see reported in the literature? Did I? Did I yeah. I wonder if you could discuss uh, very briefly the types of methods that are amenable to the, the, the strains of research that you mentioned, whether it's qualitative, quantitative, applied. Yeah, there, is, there are rock solid qualitative and quantitative approaches to all, you know, all four modes. There's a myth that, that causal inquiry is quantitative and, and interpretive inquiry is qualitative. Well, it turns out that there is great quantitative interpretive research and there is great qualitative causal research. I did a paper in 99 with five co-authors. We spent three years aboard a Navy ship. 
we were looking, we, one of the questions we were looking at is what causes people to adopt or reject a new technology. And, um, and it, was, it was three years of qualitative observations and field notes from which we were able to abstract a causal theory. Well, actually, no, sorry, it was a, uh, not causal theory, it was a, uh, a model of observed cor correlations that we derived from the qualitative data and not from the quantitative data. Then we were able to pick that model up and do some quantitative um, testing of it. And we did discover, in fact, that the, uh, that the relationships that we had discovered in our qualitative work, you know, this was a model of, uh, to, ex to explain uh, technology transition by people. And, um, and it held up very well, but it came out of qualitative research. So you can do some great qualitative research to discover and describe a phenomena. Then you can, when you want you to start to describe them and even to discover the relationships and how they correlate, and you can measure those things once you've got it. So, so yeah. And likewise, one of my favorite interpretive researchers, uh, Carl Weick, has some really strong um, quanti quantitative methods that he uses to discover what, what meanings people are ascribing to their experiences in the world's natural clubs. opportunity to keep me real honest because for one of those times I went through tenure he was my mentor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha um, so we worked together at the time and he was the one that uh, kind of gave me advice through the process um, and then I mentioned I've gotten tenure twice so nice had to do it twice um, so when I moved to Baylor University they do not uh, rarely do they give tenure uh, when you move to Baylor. Uh, very unusual, and I was not lucky enough to be one of those people who could come in with tenure, so I got to do it again. Uh, but following these th three pieces of advice worked for me two times, so maybe they'll work for you just one time, and you won't have to ever do it again. Okay, so you will learn very quickly I am a pragmatic person. Okay, so I am all about planning um, and being strategic, but also recognizing opportunities when you see them. Um, and so my first piece of advice is timing is everything. 
Um, as much as you can, even now as a doctoral student, I know first of all you're just thinking, will I even graduate? Will I get through my proposal defense? Will I get through my defense? Like, will I get a job? But start thinking about tenure now. It's actually not too early to start thinking about tenure, right? So you're going to be submitting your dossier uh, usually at the end of your fifth year as a faculty member. So I'd start thinking about what do you want your CV to look like when you go up for tenure? Um, how many conference papers do you want? What kind of journal papers do you want? What types of journals? You don't have to necessarily know every project and what journal it's going to hit at, but just know kind of the classification of journals. I want to hit, you know, three publications in the back of eight, I'd like to have two publications in this category, and you might have ideas of projects you could plug into some of those categories and maybe conferences you could try to target along the way, but start kind of working backwards and thinking about how long is it going to take me to get there, recognizing that, you know, kind of my quickest journal publication was probably 20 months. And that's really fast for a top journal. Um, it's not uncommon. I've had some projects take six or seven years. So that's why it's not too early to start thinking about the types of publications that you need. You also have to think about your rhythm, right? How you like to work in order to figure out how you're going to actually accomplish those goals. Maybe you're a person that works really well throughout the year when you have structure. Maybe you need to spend the year doing your, your, your faculty duties and just work really hard in the summer and just kind of maintain the course whenever you're um, teaching on your regular teaching semester. You've got to figure out what your rhythm is in terms of what's going to work best for you. But then also have a contingency plan, right? So things fall through the cracks. Those papers that I thought were amazing got rejected plenty of times too troublesome to find a home, well let me find a backup project to kind of slide into this spot. Or also being aware of new opportunities that might pop up that I wasn't expecting and couldn't plan for, and finding those opportunities to say yes, to kind of plug in a paper to that potential CV that I want when I go up for tenure. My second tip, oh I heard this at a doctoral consortium, and it is, I try to live by it, I often forget, but it is so true. Every yes is a no. Every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. Guard your time. It gets really easy to give it away, but it's the thing that's priceless and you can never get back. Okay, so anytime someone asks you to do something and you say yes, that means you're turning down something else. That might be sleep, it might be another project, it might be your family, it might be personal time, it might be, you know, watching reality TV, it might be playing video games, whatever is your thing, you're giving up something to say yes to something. So guard your time, be careful with it. As a junior faculty member, you are fortunate. Whenever you first get a job, most schools will protect you. They're not gonna ask you to do huge amounts of service and serve on committees, but only if you let them protect you, right? If you start saying yes, they're gonna keep asking you to do more, so be careful. Um, and it's okay to say no, right? You're gonna feel overwhelmed as a new faculty member, and that's okay, be kind to yourself in that process and recognize that that is okay. It's gonna be hard being a new faculty member, so don't give up your time too easily. But at the same time, you have to say yes to the right things. You can't say no to everything. That's not going to do you very well in the field or in your department. Because at some point, people have to vote to give you tenure. And they also, you might have to have external letters of people in the field who know you or who are familiar with your work to say, yes, you should get tenure. You only get that by saying yes to certain things. <laughs> so be strategic with your yeses. Right? If you're doing internal service at your university, find some synergy between things that you're already interested in or doing anyway. Or saying yes to external service was something I did a lot of. I, did, I reviewed pretty much any paper that people would send me. Um, now that can go too far, so be careful with that. But reviewing papers is a good way to be known by other people. Or getting involved um, in certain strategic ways at conferences is a good way to be known by other people, which really helps when you need people to write you external letters to say, yes, this person should receive tenure. My third piece of advice, get tenure for your field, not for your school. Okay, so every school has certain tenure requirements. And those tenure requirements may be uh, much more stringent than the rest of the discipline, or they might be much more lax than the rest of your discipline. Your first duty upon taking a job is understanding what are those requirements for tenure. Know what they are and make your plan in order to get to meet all of those requirements, to check that list and get through everything that you need to get tenure at your school. But you should also keep your eyes open in terms of what's required for tenure for the field. Because you know what? That job that was wonderful when you're getting out of the, you know, getting on from the market for the first time, 
few years later might not be the best place, best place for you. Right? You might decide you want to live somewhere else. For me, I moved from uh, Atlanta, Georgia to Omaha, Nebraska. After nine years, Omaha was cold. Okay? I was ready to go somewhere south. <laughs> Welcome, Texas. Um, and so uh, it was an opportunity to be able to move, but I only had that opportunity because I focused on getting tenure for the field, not for my school. If I had just checked the boxes of what was required at Omaha, I would have never had the opportunities available to me when I wanted to move. Also, if things do happen, right, like life happens, right? You, you do decide you want to change, or they decide for some reason that you're not a fit for their university and you don't get tenure. It happens. It's not the story we like to share, but it does happen. If you focus on getting tenure for your field, it's much easier to move somewhere else if you need to. So focus on your school first, right? Like get that drama over with first, right? Make sure that you've met all the requirements that your school requires. Then move on to the field and see if you can meet those hurdles in order to help you. So those are three pieces of advice that I followed to help me get tenure. about what are your personal goals right so I'd have people come up to me saying Stacy let's work on this research project and so I think there's two pieces one is knowing what things to say yes to and then also knowing how to say no right because I think that's hard I think that's hard as a junior faculty it can be particularly hard for me as a southerner uh, from the southern United States where we have to smile and be polite and as a woman right smile and be polite um, so I think finding the strategy the strategic choices that actually wasn't too hard right you started to go yes this overlaps with things that I already know something about I'm not gonna have to learn a whole new research area to work on this project it's building on an expertise that I have and so I could find those things that I could easily say yes like that's a good fit for me or this is a good service opportunity I can run a mini track in an area I'm already doing research in um, so I can learn more of the research going on in this area. That's a good fit for me. The saying no part, that's the harder part. Um, and so you have to learn your strategy to say no. Um, sometimes it's a direct no. Sorry, I can't do that, or I'm not interested. That is a really hard no to say as a junior faculty member or depending on your personality. Um, I used to use the deferred no. I really can't help you right now. Um, maybe can you check back with me in six months and see if I'm available? <laughs> So sometimes kind of not saying no immediately, but kind of leaving the door open. Um, I would do that sometimes. Um, but one thing I quickly learned is I had to just always never give a yes right away or a no right away. Um, pretty much anything anyone asks me, if you ask me to have, give you a big commitment, I'm probably gonna say, let me think about it. And that way I have time to think about whether or not it's a good fit for me and also how I'm gonna respond if it's a, Yes, if it's a no, a direct no, if it's an indirect no or a deferred no. Um, and I try not to give a deferred no unless it really, unless it really is a deferred no. Like if I'm never interested, I, I need to tell that person I'm not interested in ever doing that. It's just not a fit for me. If it is something I really am legitimately interested in but it's not, not the right time, then I give that deferred no. I don't know if that helps or is what you were getting at. <laughs> yeah, John? When planning ahead, that you I try to, but I'm not very good at that right now. Um, and so, but I still try to always say yes if I can find any capacity to say yes. Because uh, what, what I've learned too, though, is that I've learned how many projects I can balance. And I think that you have to find yours, right? So for some people, I have, I have colleagues that can only really work on one project at a time. That is gonna be not so great for your career. Learn how to juggle more than one project at a time. Um, and so I found kind of what my limit is and then once I start approaching my limit, then I start trying to carve more time in my schedule. I also kind of know which activities I can back out of or I've done quite a while or how to, I've started to learn how to create succession plans so I can create some holes in my schedule as I need to. Um, I wasn't good at that initially because it was, I had a really hard time saying no. So it's, I think you have to stay busy, but you, you know, I had, I had someone tell me, I love good quotes, which is why I did this, um, to live your life as if you're a book, right? Leave room in the margins. And so if you do leave some room in the margins, then there are opportunities when that, that really great opportunity that you want to take advantage of comes along, you have some capacity to say yes, or at least find a way to find the yes along the way. So I think you can do that. Good 
question. So a lot of that is just talking to your peers, right? So you go to events like this, you're gonna start expanding your network of um, people that are looking for jobs, <laughs> um, your classmates, you start asking them, how do you get tenure at your school? Um, you'll start hearing rumors of what someone went through and they're not gonna get tenure. And you find out what their record is and you go, oh, that's not good enough, okay. And then you start, you start to kind of normalize and see what these things are. Um, so for me, like I just talked to a lot of my friends that we all went to different schools and the, everyone in my cohort or people I went to doctoral consortia with, like we were all different schools, so we shared our norms. And then there's always that consortia people that will share usually kind of, well, here's what it takes to get tenure at X school, you know? And so you kind of learn it through those types of networks. It requires some research. It does. But that's what we're trained to do, so. <laughs> yeah, it's fair because our type of school as well. That's true. Business schools are different from high schools, mm -hmm. different from engineering schools. And of course, in Europe, the system is very different from what we have in uh, North America. Yes. So for me, I knew I'm not moving from North America, so I could limit that, right? And so I think if you kind of know what your goals are, then it's not as insurmountable as I have to be able to get tenure everywhere, right? Tenure within the types of schools that you'd be likely to go to. And it makes sense to ask your peers or to look into the profile of the person who just got tenure. Mm -hmm. If you go to your dean or so, you ask for what are the requirements here, don't do that. Because they may come up with requirements. Right. Oh. <laughs> right? And they and if you if you force your school, you know, we want to you want to have clarity, you want to have certainty. What do I have to fulfill? Well, they will come up with something. And if you have to think about kind of three basket journals, you come up with something, and then you, you are measured against that. And sometimes uh, uncertainty and equity works in your favor. Right? So because then it depends, and you can do that, it's a nice guy or a nice person. And, and a, a lot of people ask, I want to know what I have to kind of fulfill here. Right? Oh, don't ask. Because somebody will answer. <laughs> that answer might not work in your favor. Yeah, don't ask questions you don't want to know the answer to. Yes. <laughs> do you have Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm in industry or government right now. I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm not sure if I want to go into academia as a, as a professor. It's been offered to me every time, but the pay wasn't as good as what I'm getting right now. So <laughs> does, there, does there have to be a lot of past behind it? Is there actually monetary value behind it? Or um, you have to tenure? Because I don't know what the difference is between sure. a tenure professor or not. So with tenure, there's job security. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I was in industry for a while, but before I got my PhD, and I joined the telecom industry right before the telecom bust. So I got laid off very early in my career, and so the one affordance that tenure gives me is job security. I can't get fired, or at least not very easily. It's going to take an act of God just about to do that. Um, and so um, that, that's certainly that's part of what I love about the life that I have, right? So I have colleagues and I've had people ask me, like, would you, be, would you go back to industry? Um, not in your life. Like for me, I love the scholarly life that I live. I have so much autonomy and flexibility. I don't work an eight to five day uh, every week of the year, right? I work my nine months out of the year. I tend to work from nine to three and then I sprinkle in hours all over the place whenever I feel like working. Um, I get to travel the world. I get to do a lot of different things that I would have never ever had those opportunities on the path that I was in in industry. Um, and so for me, a scholarly life has been wonderful. But for others, that's just not their goals or what their dreams are. So I think part of it is figuring out what that means. But for, for those of you who aren't familiar or from industry, tenure means that you now have a, a contract that renews automatically every year. So you're not questioning whether or not you're going to have a job next year. It's guaranteed at that point. If you want to uh, know a little bit about uh, pay scales, um, Dennis Coletta uh, for many years uh, is running uh, a survey and he collects every year uh, information from people that have received offers and then they, they provide in close uh, which type of university where it was, the amount, the, the extra uh, benefits like summer support or uh, teaching load, things like that, and he puts it all in a spreadsheet. And I think through his homepage you can uh, uh, find it out. It is sort of anonymized, but it, it has information on, on whether it's a business school or high school, or and it also says whether the offer was accepted or not. And that also gives you a sense uh, of what the market is doing. And at the moment, it's a good market for you guys because it's a uh, 
it's sort of a uh, buyer's market. There's, there are multiple jobs out there, and the supply of uh, candidates is lesser than the number of good jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so for So it can depend on the university. Um, and so at both the universities I went through tenure at, they counted everything in my record. Um, but there's still going to be like red flags if you did all of your work at one school and then you never did anything anywhere else, right? The, a tenure has been described as being a multi-million dollar gamble on you. <laughs> that's really what it is, right? I mean, they're committing to spending millions of dollars on you because they've guaranteed you this job for as long as you want to be there. And they've given a promise to you that you, haven't, that you don't return anything. Right? They're, you're, they're hoping you continue to be productive. So you're having to demonstrate to them that history of doing so. So some universities can be more stringent. I think these are good things that you ask during the job search process just to understand like what do they count. Um, or or soon, definitely as soon as you get there if you haven't already, you know, don't know this information. Um, so you can plan accordingly. What is flexibility in academia mean for having a family, especially for women? Yes, <laughs> so I have, I have an 11 year old. I, um, my son was four weeks old at my defense, my final dissertation defense. So he came early. I was supposed to uh, get my defense nine months pregnant and I thought that was the perfect time to defend because who's gonna turn down a pregnant woman who could go into labor any minute? Um, no, the best time is having a four week old in the room and you don't know when he's gonna cry any minute for his mom. Right, so dad's in the back holding baby while I'm defending. Um, no, and so I love it. In the, I mean, almost every day I take my son to school and I pick him up to school. That's why I work basically 8.30 to 3 is because I take him to school and I pick him up from school. Um, I'm there for most of his basketball games or any activities that he does. Like, I, I get to set my schedule for the most part. Now, conferences, that messes things up sometimes. I have missed a few things here and there for traveling or just sometimes you have to teach at night and you miss trick-or-treating. But for the most part, um, I have been able to find a great work-life balance doing it. It took some struggle at times, but it's more about me <laughs> than about the job itself. But I think it's also dependent too on the types of, um, how you want to craft your life and your choices, right? What types of schools you choose to go to, um, what types of choices you want to make with your family. And that's for all parents or people, right? Anyone that has any kind of family, whether it's a young child or you're caring for parents or whatever it might be. Um, there can be a lot of opportunity for flexibility, um, but it, the curse that goes with that is making sure that you stop working at some point or that you, you know, make some choices to say, yep, now is, is family time. But I do worry about my son because he has a stay-at-home dad and I'm home all the time. So I don't think he really understands what work is like. So I'm hoping that he gets out of our house when he turns 18, but we'll see. How about getting pregnant <laughs> um, great question. I mean, again, I did my pregnancy during the PhD program, and again, quite planned. Um, I'm a planner for sure. Uh, I had a window. <laughs> I was like, if I can get pregnant during this time, I can still travel while I'm pregnant and be hiding it while I'm on the market. I don't think I needed to hide it, but I just wasn't sure. Um, I think getting pregnant before tenure can be challenging. Um, a lot of schools, though, will allow you to have an extra year, um, you know, to to help compensate for the, the loss of productivity. Um, I, think, uh, I think it's doable, but again, you, you need to plan for it or be prepared for, um, there's gonna be challenges or kind of learn how you best handle that. I think some, some people go through it swimmingly with no problems and other people really struggle. And I think part of that depends on your personality. Some of it depends on the school and the situation you're in. Some of it depends on your kid um, and how, easy of a kid they are, other familial support. I mean, I, I sent my husband's a stay-at-home dad, so it was a little easier in our case that if both of us worked. So I think it just kind of, you have to think through your situation and what works for you, but it's doable. <laughs> it's uh, time yeah. to move on. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I know two people still awake. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Better. So when I was asked to present, and I was a substitute, and never, I realized I never documented uh, how I got grants or best practices or reflected on it. So this is a reflective document, 
and a piece of conversation. It's completely possible that I have not prepared to share the nuggets because I don't even know. I have been doing this for 20 years. So I really want you to ask me questions. So I was thinking about how to uh, frame this. So I framed it as three questions. And one of the question definitely is not, will I get tenure if I get grants? You, know, you can ask me about it later and I'll have a two hour uh, monologue on it. But uh, a brief background, I like getting grants. I focus on one particular thing when I write grants. Um, it is, I love the idea that I get paid uh, to do research and that means the market values that research. So that, that's the basic reason why I like uh, writing grants. But it is, um, it's something that uh, you have to do, uh, you have to practice. And all of you here definitely, and most of uh, the emerging scholars, I'm very comfortable in saying that uh, we teach you how to do research well. We do. Um, but what we don't do very well is force you to answer the question, is it worth doing? And grants force you to answer that question. It evaluates you based on intellectual merit and broader impacts. First of all, is it science? And it's shocking when they tell you it is not. And you're like, are you kidding me? I, you know, I'm, I, I defended my proposal. How can it not be science? So uh, is it science that's worth doing? It does it advance knowledge. And is it self-evident? And so it is, um, you're asking for a lot of money. And if you can deduct some best practices without spending a lot of money, and if it's self-evident, and of course it's important to do replication work, it's important to um, empirically test certain things that seem self-evident, but if you're going to ask for millions of dollars, uh, it's not going to fly for that's one aspect of is it worth doing. The second is the broader impact. You have to tackle problems that are difficult, that are complex. And um, EIS is now moving towards societal impact. And when you write grants, that is central to uh, your uh, um, uh, part of influencing the reviewers is how it, uh, this piece of work uh, have even implication, not definitely always a direct contribution, but implication uh, to a societal impact. Uh, what do you need? A necessary skill, I said necessary, not sufficient. Um, courage, and I think uh, people would say risk, but you need to uh, be aware that it'll take time to get money. You may not get any money for a while, if you get the money and do the work, it may not get into your top journals. And uh, solving big problems takes time. Will you be able to publish uh, where you are showing the problems is not yet solved? So you have to have the courage to say, okay, no, I want to do this. Uh, real problems and real inputs, uh, it goes back to broader impact as well in science and by association capability. So we can talk a little bit about it collectively afterwards, but what I'm trying to get at as a necessary skill is when you start writing, have a conversation with people who have written grants. It took me a while to just list three. I'm like, what are those things? And I do not know for sure that there are other necessary skills that I should have written here. So look at their profiles and get to know what does it take to convince the reader that your research is worth doing. We're saving the world. The second is how can I build a strong collaborative team? Wicked problems cannot be solved by one scholar. You have to have a team of scholars. There are 
two groups. One are the PIs, principal investigators and co-principal investigators, and others are graduate students, your advisory board, your evaluators, and you need to build a team. How do you do that? The PIs have to be on the same page. They don't have to be from the same school, same discipline, but they have to be on the same page with regards to is it worth solving? Is the problem worth solving? Commitment level, meaning if you are working with uh, engineering folks where after you have solved the problem, maybe patented it, they're never interested in writing it up for a UTD, UT Dallas ranking journal then you'll be the only one trying to publish that work. So some common commitments towards the end goal is necessary. That's pragmatism. I didn't do that very well. Uh, so I'm advocating for that. At least think about it. Um, the research objective and purpose. It will be amazing. It's amazing how many researchers uh, do research for different objectives. Of course, you can hear think for publishing. Not necessarily. Research grants um, at diff in different colleges are written for different purposes. For some, just getting the grant and the money attached to it isn't enough of, um, is enough to get them tenured if they get enough of those grants. Uh, shared understanding of the problem is important, else they'll never get to solving the problem. And uh, try to uh, get to work with people that complement your skill set. Other team members, be ready to tell them what they will be doing on your grant. Be very clear on that. And um, you know who the, your PIs are. And then if you don't have certain skill set or you're very expensive to do those tasks, then have other people doing those tasks. So augment your absorptive capacity. The necessary skill leadership is critical. You should be able to direct people um, at the same time, able to build and maintain relationships and, and communicate effectively. You get the grant, you have a good team. Um, if you want to get more <laughs> grants, make sure you added value. You executed it well. Now, the execution doesn't mean you executed exactly the way you wrote up the grant. And if you wrote up the grant and if it uh, derived value, that's great. But most often, you will have to act and react and change things. And it is okay to do that. If you think it will add value, most uh, grant agencies will extend the time. If you haven't spent the money, they may not give you more money but they'll extend the time. So um, the value derivation is critical if you want to continue to go back to the same agency or even different agency and ask for more money. Disseminate the results. That's one thing I had to learn um, the hard way. The first grant we received, NSF asked, um, the National Science Foundation asked us to send them nuggets. And me and my co-PI, we were very young, and you're like, what are nuggets? I mean, you know, so we looked at our work, wrote up a, a scholarly paragraph, two paragraphs of our nugget, and the program director came back and uh, told us, okay, write it in a way a congressman or a congresswoman can understand. And then we're like, oh, okay, that's the nugget. And th that was a hard thing to do. And uh, what I realized, if I disseminated in different places other than the scholarly journals, we have to do that, I learned how to share my nuggets well. So I started, whoever would allow me to write in their magazine or a business journal, uh, I would write in it. So as I started doing that, um, one of the grants to five years ago we received, got a comment that you know, the best section I've ever read in any of the uh, write-up was the dissemination section. And it came after 15 years of practice of uh, how to disseminate your work. And um, 
the question is, and I haven't asked this question here, and you may ask me and others can respond. If you answer these three questions and do it well, will it get you tenure? That's a question I'm not asking. Uh, but one commonality between practicing to get tenure and practicing to get uh, grants is time management. Use your time well. You can write as many grants as you want, but you need to know all of the things that uh, Stacy was mentioning, and you need to constantly correct yourself when you don't get the grant, then maybe it was not the topic I was an expert in. Uh, maybe it is not the research I can do. So um, uh, doing that will help you get most out of the grant writing process, which is very cumbersome. Uh, entrepreneurial spirit, uh, it, it is like managing a little business once you get the grant. Uh, so you need to have that spirit of entrepreneurialness and to kind of keep trying and changing uh, your proposed idea to add value uh, because you will have to go back and sell it to the people who have uh, provided uh, the grant. A uh, finish, and I talked a little bit about it uh, during lunch with our group, is you need to have a person on your team who's a finisher. Else you'll continue to extend the time and you'll continue to kind of do research and never the grant will never end and you'll never get to publish the results from your grant. So these are my three questions. And I can answer, and once I say this is reflective, so the piece of conversation. How many of you have worked on a grant? Why? I have a question. Uh, what, what, what would you say is the impact of grants on an academic career? Okay, I will say which academic? In business school uh, or mm -hmm. uh, any uh, school? And I think so, the answer might differ. I guess business school. Okay. I, I don't really know how to answer it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how to answer yours back. Okay, so if you're in an. Uh, College of College business. Uh, College of business from an uh, high school. Yeah. Mm, very different. Um, in business school, there are some business school. Arizona is one of them where you know grants are valued and it's part of your tenure process. You know, getting a but at my institution, it wasn't. It's a you need to figure out is it uh, in business school. I'm talking about in high school, it's part of the equation to get tenure. But in business school, um, how many of you are from business school here? Yeah. And how many of you know the requirements for getting tenure in your school? Do you have grant writing? No. No for grants. Anybody else? Kind? Which school? I think it was graduate school, so it's perhaps a little niche, but the, the, the two criteria is do they like you, and that's a very fluid, back to your point, you know, don't ask for what you don't want to know, and somebody with a whole bunch of grants and maybe lower tier pubs might do okay, because if you're bringing in lots of money, that's good. Which school are you? Uh, I'm out of Arkansas, and uh, uh, grants are valued, but I, I don't believe that they are meaningfully counted towards tenure based on my perception, you know, having been there. My personal experience, uh, my full professorship, I got it, I think, because of the grants. My tenure was because of my publication. And uh, because the provost is like, come on, we have, so the, outside of the college, they were valued. But in the college, you had to have the publication, and then it was like uh, it was like su a sunny afternoon in Hawaii. If there is no sun, water is still nice. But if the sun comes out, water looks even more beautiful. Water is the grand, sun is the top tier publication in business school. But now, high school is different. Engineering school is different. You have to get. You have to have, the, the formula is the amount of money you bring in. 
and not only the number of grants, but the amount of money you bring in. Um, no one looks at it, did you publish from your grant or not? Because research is really expensive in sciences. It's, it, it is costing every institution, if they get one dollar, they're adding two more dollars to do that work, even after they get those FNA money uh, from the research grant, they have to add more money in sciences and engineering to do the science they're doing. So it's just expensive. So knowing that, going back to Stacy's recommendation, depending on the school, what you say yes to is, is considerably influenced by do you participate in this grant or do you participate in this project that's going to lead to research? But also, Stacy said, said, said also that kind of a good school will protect you as a, as a young researcher, right? And most schools, they don't ask you as an assistant professor to raise money. Uh, but it's true, you only get full professorship if you, are, if you are able to raise money. But a good school, actually at my school and most universities in Europe, they actually don't accept, they don't want you to work on grant proposals because that takes a lot of time out of your already kind of short time frame as an assistant professor being on tenure track, focus on your research, right? So uh, that said, it is kind of also recommended that you are a junior partner with somebody who is writing grant proposals. But you as an assistant professor, you're not expected to do that, and you can burn easily a lot of time. And the outcome, uh, if you are aiming for an EU funding, acceptance rate is something like between three and six percent. Uh, so you burn a lot of time and it's like like lottery. Don't do that as an assistant professor. So you find me but you asked about the academic career. A full professor means money. But the problem happens is you train yourself to publish and have not practiced write, grant writing. You, it's not a switch that you just turn on after you've gotten tenure. Uh, you have already you have a sandbox that you've played in. And now uh, you can change the sandbox. It is tougher and you are tenured so you can do it. But the kind of questions you have asked uh, may not be the questions that the grant agencies are willing to fund. And you haven't iterated enough number of times to find out if they will fund you. So the, the, the how you play and how you win in those two spaces are different. There is some overlap, and then you see uh, the profiles. Uh, you go to Arizona comes to mind all the time whenever I think about grant writing. So you can. There is an overlap, but the sandboxes are different. They get in an MISQ and going and getting a grant and managing it till you get value out of it. So you can write another one. Yeah, two, two small observations with respect to the business schools. Uh, I think especially the state business schools, but uh, the atmosphere is changing a bit because the budgets are coming down. And so from administration, there's more and more push for grant dollars because it brings in what you mentioned, the f &A. That means for those of you who are from the North America system, facilities and administration. It's the overhead. So if you need $100,000 to do your research, um, typically, it's somewhere between 40 and 60 percent that the university will put on top of it to the funding agency. So, say the funding agency NSF, they accept 50 percent. So then the money that comes in is $150, $50,000, and $50,000 goes directly to the university. So they're very happy with you if their budget is tight and that you bring in those extra dollars. It, it doesn't all go to your research. Um, so I, at USF. Uh, they now have recently sort of changed the language in the in the tenure uh, documentation. It's not very specific. Uh, they they also like to have that wiggle room, uh, but clearly grants uh, competitive grants are valued and they count along towards tenure. So that's one thing. The other thing I wanted to mention is also the other thing that Stacy said is strategic yeses, and she gave an example. There's this project opportunity, I'm already working in this area, so maybe it won't cost me as much time, I don't have to shift myself completely. That's the same thing with a grant, because the beauty with a grant as a junior researcher is that if you are successful, it, it does look good on your resume, 
and you make that funding for some very talented graduate students that can help your research program along. Because a lot of the work for research is time intensive. So if you get funding um, by working on something that you're already doing, then maybe the risk is smaller in terms of losing time, and the payoff can be very high because it helps your research program. Yeah, that's a good point. If it is in the space that you're already working in, and there are avenues to write a grant, then if there are synergies, it is worth doing. But there are things that you have to do when you have grant, like annual reports, uh, nuggets, going and presenting, talking to the program director because you didn't have, uh, the evaluator say you didn't do uh, what you were supposed to do that year and answering those questions. Those are the things that makes your science better, absolutely. But those are the things you don't have to worry about when you're doing your research and publishing. Reviewers may come back and reject it. Yeah, that, that's a different story. But there are different activities that may be seen as non-value added uh, when you're managing a grant. But if you're co-PI or if you are um, one way to get experience is be a consultant, be on the advisory board. If you have an expertise in certain area, whether it's stats or whether it's theory, you can be on uh, a grant as a consultant or a grant uh, on the grant as uh, on the advisory board. And that can help you at least uh, observe how the grant process unfolds till you're ready to write your book. Maybe I can add something here because this is really important. Stacy and I we were running mid-career workshops. So people who just got tenure and now they're wondering what comes next. Right? And a lot of people, and that's how the system works, are socialized and, 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 and they became high performance paper machines. Because that, that's what we expect from you as a PhD student and afterwards on a tenure track. You produce papers to fill the pipeline, why do we have so many papers in the pipeline? That's what you learned for a long time. And suddenly you're expected to raise money, right? So, wow, uh, that's what, exactly what you said. Just as to reinforce what you said. Mm -hmm. But it's better you prepare yourself for this yeah. by, by making yourself familiar with what, how this is working here at my university, or can I be a, a junior partner in a proposal or so to learn the game? Because that is the next currency which your university is looking for if you're able to raise money. Because you have to be a good ambassador for your place and you have to bring in money if you want to get uh, full professor position. And that's not something which comes overnight, kind of uh, another right of process. And at least in the US, I think there'll be less and less money um, from the state, the, for the state schools. And your admins and your dean is looking to find revenue models. And this is going to be one of the ways to raise money. So in the future, who knows, the tenure and promotion guidelines might be, be slowly evolving into have fun, getting funding for your own work. And it doesn't always have to be from the agencies. It can be from private industries as well. And there's the Sloan Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. And they are more kind of sources than you may think, yeah. which fund your early research. And Kaufman. Different from, I think, many other universities. My university, City University of Hong Kong, we expect actually our uh, early career faculty to apply for funding and to apply every year. Uh, so in my area, we expect that you have two grants, two uh, competitive external research grants to, to make it uh, through the tenure process. In other areas, in the university, one. So and the chance, however, is, is better, like one in four, so that you get it. But these are so government grants. Uh, and uh, so the rule or the advice I give to early career faculty is um, you work on your research, you work through the, through the publication process and as you're getting close then that's what you apply for in your research grant and essentially you sell to the granting agency a work where you know where you have a high chance that it succeeds because you already are very close to, to a, acceptance of your paper, then that's the research you sell, you get your grant, and it feeds you with the money for the next work. So you're essentially always selling what you've done, and you're always sort of advancing a little bit of your work uh, uh, to that granting source. I think it's a very good model. Nobody is doing, the only one who up front is you, and, and you're always sort of lowering the risk for the granting agencies because the outcome will be there, because it's 
already almost in your hands. I think this is really a model and it works really in a way towards um, work that is to be sought after because the granting agency says, yes, that's what we want and what we want. That's interesting. A lot of engineering folks do that, right? Uh, the current grant that they have received is funding the future grant. And now, and now, when I first wrote my grant in 1999, 2000, uh, we didn't have any data. Then it was two studies, good ideas, very little money. Uh, we asked for junior faculty, they looked at our profiles, that's one thing I should talk about, and they gave us, because we didn't ask for much, um, uh, but we, it, it, it kind of fueled, uh, um, lost the main point I was going to say, but uh, asking, uh, I'll get back to the point I was going to make, but I, I, another point I want to make is, when you have 10 pages at NSF to write what you want to write. You had five, right? You guys got five pages. Five more pages and a lot more to cover. Fill in the blanks are filled by the peer reviews through what you have done, who you are. So when you build a team or if you uh, have not written everything in the proposal, but in your bio it says you have done that work and successfully done that work and published it, that fill in the gaps for the things that are not confusing for the reviewers. And now I think I get the grant mainly on my bio more than the 10 pages that I write. But it takes a while to do that. And it is similar to what you just mentioned, is writing proof of concept. There. Sometimes the proof of concept is in your bios and in your team. Thanks. Uh, I worked without PowerPoints. Um, first, before I get started, I want to say a few things on so we get some general ideas. I, I, as I mentioned already, I come from the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, with me is Octavia, also from the City University of Hong Kong. Um, we are a relatively young university, 31 years old and quite aggressive, so we are, we are pushing very hard on these uh, criteria. Um, so grants are important for us. We also let our early career faculty know what the publication, uh, what the general tenure requirements are. And there, there's a document. I'm, I'm in the provost office also, so I know that very well. And so we know, for example, let's say we are in the business school, that's three uh, papers in what might be on your A-plus list. If you are in my school, the School of Creative Media, that would be, we call it, um, uh, four signature items, okay? And then, uh, so there is a certain uh, vagueness in defining that, signature items, what does that mean? So that's always, you have to live with that, but at least you have sort of some parameters. If you have only three items and you are required to have four, you know you're short. And so with the grants, we count that quite, uh, in quite some detail. And there's also, so we get number side to all of this, and I, talk a little about that when I talk about the, uh, uh, the uh, getting published. Uh, one more point I think is worthwhile to mention. So in my university, the way I would describe it, uh, if you are an assistant professor, you're kind of, sort of getting started. If you're already an associate professor, that means um, recognized in your field. And that means internationally recognized, not Hong Kong recognized, right? So internationally recognized. If you want to become a full professor, that I was mentioning here also, that would be a leader in your field. And if you want to be a chair professor, you have to somehow have to help. Either you define a field or you're one of the people who define a field. And that's kind of so your escalation in terms of uh, your progression in, as I would say, in my university. But my topic is not uh, about that. My topic is about um, so we success in getting published. And uh, I started with a little story. I, my PhD was in British Columbia. And uh, when I studied there, one of my professors uh, uh, said to all of us in the class, it was like uh, first or second year, oh, every coursework, major coursework assignment, so with the, the last assignment in the coursework, you should always get published. Uh, and we are going, oh, yeah, yeah, two, blah, blah, blah. And we would not believe it. And it was uh, so with us always this doubt. Uh, this cannot be possible. And uh, that, to me, really finds the first um, so we, a lesson I want you to, uh, to take with you, and it's a little more eso esoteric. That is when we start out, it's really we are at the outside looking in. And if you're at the outside looking in, it means really you don't know the rules of the game. 
And then it seems so impossible. So for us, it was preposterous. Someone says, you can get your homework published, OK? Uh, seems like unreasonable in a way. Uh, but as you move on, so you go from the outside moving in, looking in to, uh, to a level of competency. And when you have competence, it means you understand the rules of the game. And so become, you can operate in these rules and, uh, and do quite well with it. And this is uh, after a while. And what it takes to be competent is actually practice. You know, this be, one of the simple rules about uh, getting published is publishing, writing a lot. Uh, we all, in, in, so when we have PhD students, we learn very well how to criticize other works. So it's kind of, uh, the worst thing is that you have, if you're an author, you are, you are writing an article and you have so PhD students as your reviewers because they are so mean. Uh, because we know how to kill articles as PhD students. Uh, writing is the much harder side and we don't practice it enough. So to get to this level of competency, write, 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 and, and submit, submit, submit. And really this, the last level, mastery, that's not just knowing the rules in a way it's, so we, you do this with ease and it, that doesn't mean you're constantly being accepted, but you know always what it takes or you redefine what success is in your, in your area so that you can do this repetitively and with ease. And that's, if you want to do really well in your career, that's where you have to end up mastery level because then it's sort of execution at a very strong level. And so this is really in your mind, and there's no matter, it's in terms of all career, mastery, being able to do it with ease. And oftentimes it really means being able to redefine the rules. So we had Jay, Jay here in the room, Jay Nanomaker, ask him whether he's still worried about getting published. And you know what the answer is, okay? Um, and uh, so that's the first uh, point I want to make um, about sort of my meta advice. Next is, uh, I think, what and where, and we, we discussed it in our team, uh, when it comes to so being successful in public, in being uh, published, uh, for me it's always is, do something worthwhile, which means a interesting, which means for me is always, there has to be a surprise in there. And that is, can I explain something that other people didn't know? And before I wrote it, they didn't understand it. I give an example. Um, I'm interested in this crowd work. And so why would people, in, when they work in crowds, willingly work for 20 cents on the dollar, so for a fifth of their normal salary, and they do this crowd work when they otherwise would never do it. It doesn't make sense. If we can find an explanation for that, wow, we can explain something that others don't do. And that's really what journals will be interested in, or what publication outlets will be interested in. So that's what I like to, to write about. There's a surprise in there, I can explain it, and ideally it has some lasting value so that this is not just a one-shot thing. So this is my, my first advice is do something like that. It makes it worthwhile, it makes it interesting for you to work on it, it makes it interesting for others to, to read what you're doing. Um, you work always, and I would say first from shallow to deep, but we should, we work from deep to deeper. So the first paper in this, in this area should be so we, you, are, you are capturing this phenomenon and people know you about it. And then your next paper should not just so we jump to, the, uh, to another aspect of the phenomenon at the same level, but go deep. Show now that you have learned these week the, the knowledge of explaining it as a more, uh, at a deeper, more significant level. And so dig deeper, especially if you, if you're thinking about your tenure work, because you have to explain something at the level where others later who write letters for you say, this person really knows, and this is really important. So in my choice of, of, uh, of uh, things that are right, you might, there might be some so early, they are sort of phenomenal level, and, but then go deeper and really try to explain why can crowds explain something that other people cannot explain? So why is a crowd smarter than the individual? Is an explanation. At first you describe the phenomenon, and so we explain it at the phenomenal level, uh, uh, and then uh, go deeper and explain what are the mechanisms that are going on. That's because in, then where people realize, oh yeah, you know something, right? Um, know your journals or know your outlets. For all of us, and you know, this is from looking in from the outside. We don't know our outlets. There are so many, right? And so uh, we have to learn what the right outlets are. What's the right outlet for an idea? Who publishes so the stuff I'm publishing? 
but even more importantly, I think, is who publishes the methodology I'm using. Because oftentimes the topic doesn't matter so much as, as the methodology. And when you ask, well, how do I know? Well, what do you like to read is a good first cut. So if you like to read the work in a particular journal, maybe that's the journal for you. Maybe I ask my supervisor, who should also know. Or if your institution is kind of well organized, they have lists. In my organization, <laughs> we have lists, okay? We, uh, we have lists for what counts every year, what counts for 10 years and so on. Uh, and of course, there's a basket for the, uh, uh, so we, uh, so the uh, significant journals. But you know, sometimes your best work may not end up in the, uh, you know, in the A plus journal. And why? Because A plus journals are highly conservative. So they may not want to touch it when it's fresh, and you may not want to wait three and a half years because then it's kind of not so interesting anymore. So your best work may actually end up in a, in a good but not so, not the best journal, and then year later your deeper work on that same topic may end up in the best journal. And that's kind of uh, because, so it become, has become respectable, and then you can kind of, uh, you get in there, you have a track record. But really, uh, some journals are really interested in the, in the hot work, but others are really, they have a conservative approach and they don't want to touch it, or they have anyway such a long review process uh, so, knowing your review process is clearly also uh, a thing to keep in mind, which is a part of why are you getting published. The one thing is we are getting published because so we, we want to explain something, but for many of us and many of you who are sitting here in the room and are significantly younger than I am, so there are still hurdles. Uh, you are getting, so we're getting through your dissertation, getting through that tenure process. And you will have to get published to make it through uh, your tenure process. I said. Uh, three significance or A plus or something like that or four uh, uh, signature items. There should be a list and if there's no list, you should ask people who really know. Don't ask the other assistant professor. They are really so like, a bad source of advice. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, ask people who have gone through the process. We heard that before. Who have recently gone through the process or best people who sit on those committees who make the decisions because they really know and they know also how decisions are being made. So from that, which journals and that's a one way or kind of which ones count and you, you know in some disciplines they say everything is which is SCI or SSCI or some say if you're top quarter, top quartile or if you're top 10 percent and so um, as you go along, you'll see there, sorry, there's the Schemago index, which shows you who's top quarter and so on. Um, but understand, so the journal quality, uh, and I meant, notice I'm mentioning journals a lot, I don't mention conferences at this time, which also means something. Uh, but really clearly, so we understand the spectrum of journals, but that's sort of quality is one thing. Uh, so selectivity and so on. But uh, the other thing is also know your journals in terms of timeline. And this came up, we heard about 10 years. No, 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 I, I always say um, your tenure clock is three years long, uh, which means so after three years, you still have another contract coming up, but that's only to execute. So you have really three years to write, and then everything else is just to revise and resubmit and then get it done. So if you have a journal that has, you know, if you, it's like your fourth year or so, and you now you want to still have it count for your tenure, it has to be a relatively short cycle journal. If you need something to be done within the next half year, it has to be a really short cycle journal. So you have to know those your journals by, by the, so the time it takes to, to get done. And there are short cycle journals. If you have an idea that you really want to get out fast, um, and I, I say thanks to the late Paul Gray, uh, he created the uh, communication of the AIS. And you know, he made it a journal where if you had a great idea, but it wasn't yet so refined to, so to get it out and get it out quickly, uh, you tell the world, that's me and this is what I'm, uh, what I'm doing. And um, if you look at the um, citation counts, I haven't looked recently, but for quite a while it was that um, JIS and CS, where JIS is with the, the very refined long cycle, they had similar citation counts per article. One was a fast moving one, the other was a, was a very careful one. If you ask me for interesting work, I like the fast cycle. It may not be as refined, but it, but it tells a story. 
How much? Okay, so uh, as a, there is so oh, we sometimes we write for grants and then it has to fit within the grant cycle also to get it all out because you have to show the grant people something that you have done the work <laughs> for which they commissioned you. But how much do you have to publish? Ah, I you know my my own goal was always uh, so first of all it's A B C for me A journals B journals and not C journals but conference articles okay. So, and the conference is really sort of uh, get things out quickly, you're, you're in the game, and it's a great chance, first of all, to travel to some nice place, and, 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 but it's a chance for sharing, because in order to get things done, is, yeah, preparation, so you, you write a lot, but you also need to have other people to sort of essentially bounce off your uh, uh, ideas by, and this is, you can do that at home, or you can do that at a conference, and so, before you send something to a, a journal, it should always have gone through a number of rotations where you had a chance to, to get sort of the really rough edges out of it and, and make it smoother. And conferences are a really good place. Uh, and some of them, like here, Hicks, if you write a nice paper, you may get a fast track, so then you get sort of two for the price of one. So A, B, C, and why B? Why would you right away willingly uh, write for B? Well, have a portfolio. You know, I said you have three, sig four signature items, but you have to also have some, have some mass. And my university is not just, oh, I just have four signal gems, I'm done. Uh, you should show some, um, ah, there is a body of knowledge. And it's also, uh, people want to read a little more from you than just your, your four items. Uh, and you may want to send some more stuff out to other people to show, yes, you, you, there is something. So when you have your tenure uh, like set of stuff, uh, then better have not just with your four items, but a significant amount. For me, I always try so like uh, two plus two or something. Two journal articles, two conferences in a year. Uh, I should say probably N plus M. So where if you're like a really busy bee, then you want to do, do a lot more than that. But so kind of having that out, if I can do that, so continuously. And that's for me also very important. Continuous work, doing something all the time. Never run a year without anything. This kind of uh, because, and I look at myself and oh, nothing in this year. What happened? Which really tells me something. Oh, there. So I'm uh, maybe not so good in terms of my uh, my time allocation. So uh, I think an N plus M strategy, journals and conferences, is uh, quite uh, quite good. And if you see, if your early career and you said like two journal articles a year out, that would give you some like twelve or so in a in your six year window. For some universities that may, may not even be enough, they may want to have something like fifteen or eighteen, so you may have to have it three plus two or something like that. It really depends on, on where you're from. Others may say, Oh, I don't I only want to see your three best items and you're done. That can also be then that's really a very insightful university. But many want, as I said, some bulk in there. Okay, once, and then I come to my last step, my last item here, which is really the preparation. I already talked about, uh, so practicing, it's really, it's practicing, you know. If I look at my early papers, oh my God. And even I look at papers where I thought that right, really quite good, and then I read them half a year later, how could I have written it, I'm, I'm saying to myself, which is really so, right, 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 and you turn it out, and even if it's not yet done, you send it out, you get it submitted, you don't spend too much time on the revision. Also, I, I learned that that was advice from, uh, from one of my uh, mentors before. Uh, at one time, I got my revisions back for, uh, I think it was an Omega article or so, it was some kind of a, an easy uh, revision. He said, don't spend more than one day. And I think, what? You know, this was from the outside looking in. Don't spend more than one day, so, uh, one day. And he was right. Don't spend too much because he could see that paper was already in the bag. And rather spend that extra time on something else. So preparation, uh, be judicious with your time. Um, bounce your ideas off at other people internally and at the conferences. Uh, I'm also a big believer on the, you know, at the conferences, whenever we put together some slides, which I didn't do, that's a scaffold. It's a really wonderful thing. You, you write your PowerPoints, and that's really the, the, the structure, the corset uh, of, your, uh, of your journal article, and it works really well. So uh, that's really in terms of uh, succeeding, is really that practice element. I really wouldn't, uh, wouldn't underestimate. And uh, I end off on the kind of sad note because, uh, you know, I, as I said, I always like to write the like, N plus M. And then I also look at my Google citation counts. And I, at the end of the year, I always looked and said, okay, if in the last year my, you know, Google citation shows you five years and all your career, uh, and if I had more than half in my last 
five years. That meant, or oh, I'm still sorry, on the on the. Uh, uh, the upward uh, trajectory, and this year is my first year where I'm actually less than half on my uh, on my last five years. So I, I know I'm going downhill, which is uh, my uh, my sad note, which is because I'm too much involved in in uh, administration at my university. Uh, and sadly, my next better bill is only coming up in whatever, probably two years or so. So on that I end. Open for questions. addicted to look up their age index, right? So yes. Google, right? Where, why do you do that? It's always kind of frustrating to Google yourself, right? So yes, very frustrating. You know, do we, we are in a business of frustrating. We, are, we, are, we <laughs> like this, this being hammered by reviewers who tell us we are no good. That means uh, you think about you and your, your university among the top uh, students, then you go through the PhD program, which is so harsh, and then you, you enjoy other people telling you, oh, you are no good, you are no good, you are no good. And wait for something that's satisfaction of like nine months, 12 months, 15 months. What kind of life are we living, right? Okay. After Stacey's told you how awesome. Yeah, I I just want to go back to the show. Okay, a couple of quick questions. I forgot that aspect of mine. Um, you know, when I started out, I always liked to write on my own. And, I, and uh, this really, uh, to be also a personal item, right? Uh, are you more sort of a team oriented person or individual? You must have both in a way, okay? I, I really believe uh, uh, so. When you write on your own, you show this is what I can do on my own, okay? Uh, but realistically, in today's world, in the root of world, Writing in a team is really advisable, okay? Um, so two, three people is sort of the, the sweet spot, I would think. In, in my part of the world, we often see write handball teams or basketball teams writing together, five people or so, which is already a little bit too large a number, and oftentimes so some people kind of uh, end up adding very little to the process, but absolute advisable. You get multiple ideas, you get specialization, some people bring in certain, uh, let's say they are very good on the statistics part, or, Yes, do it. But at the same time, always, when it comes to tenure time, when it comes to tenure time, people will always look, can you do it on your own? And then also is with your supervisor. For a while, write with your supervisor. You're getting on your dissertation stuff out, but then show I can do it without them. Okay, I don't need them anymore. Okay? Very important, because otherwise, people will always go, this was your supervisor's idea or so. No, 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 this was my own. And if you spread this around and kind of show you can be successful with multiple people, it's also a very good indication. Yeah, Omar mentioned the uh, Google I index or H index. Um, how important is it now, coming back to the uh, tenure track thing, how do universities look at this? Oh. Or don't they look at this at all? So, what is your take on this? That's an awful, that's, that's an awful. And the, the problem is kind of, once data is out, it is used, right? Data will always be beat no data, however bad the data is, right? So there's this data out, and you can't help, you always with one eye look at that one. Everybody agrees it's a bad index, you know, it's, it's not kind of giving you the full picture, it's called numbers, it's just a document of numbers, right? But of course, with one eye, you have, you have to look at that. But it should not determine whether or not you are hiring a person, right? But it's, so it's it, there's more to that than just the age index. But it's becoming an obsession for in many places. I Early career. That, oh, sorry. Go I was just gonna say that I will say if if you do well in it, want it. Um, yeah. And so if you get lucky and get a highly cited paper early in your career, use it. And if you can show, like I've used. I just submitted actually my, my promotion dossier to get promoted for full. And so my university, I don't have to get grants, but I did use Publisher Parish and Google Scholar to show, well, my paper was the third most cited paper in Aegis or whatever it was, right? So you got to use it. But I think it is, tenure committees need to be cautious in how they use this, but that's going to vary from school to school. So recognize in your field, leader in your field, Defining a field, and the higher you get, the more you have to indicate that so you are the 
one the most cited or the most cited in that subfield or so that makes sense you know early career assistant professors to to associate if you have some tractions that people actually cite you sorry good sign uh, this is really citation that is comes with having more bulk so it really favors uh, uh, people longer in the game or branding and oftentimes so if you have a, a famous co-author early on in your career it helps you so that's where the branding effect really kicks in it's, uh, uh, that we, in a way, undervalue uh, in our tenure process because we know uh, really early on you have just so little to show. In our school, the research impact, one of the metric is citations. Where it matters, not all citations. And so it, it's a portfolio of metrics for research impact. And university has drive to 25, becoming top 25. We said public universities and citations is one of the metrics to drive to 25. So once it is there, <coughs> available to be measured, yeah, it'll be. But at least it's one of the metrics of impact, not the only. Well, if you want to pick your age index, then have an open access Springer book which you edit on some hype topic. Ask others to hand in the chapter in the book, and you get a fantastic age index. And that's, you have to look at the age index, what's in the package. And that's what I'm saying. Right? So it's, and it's this, or a lot of uh, uh, papers which are highly cited, I have written are kind of opinion pieces, editorials, right? so which have impact, because kind of people refer to that. But you know, is that, the, is that what you want to build your career on, right? On, you have this one editorial which is heavily cited, right? So it, is, it, it comes down to hopefully you end up in the application process where people who are assessing you know how to look at you. And if you have a great age index, that's good, that's great. But you know, you want to be perceived as the person and not as this age equals 20 and 24. If you have six articles written, your age index cannot be higher than six after all. So if, <laughs> if you have ten, it cannot be higher than ten and so on. So it's really, uh, you can see where the right away goes. And so many early career have so we single digits and small single digits. As I said, uh, it's uh, not particularly significant, not particularly meaningful very early on in, in, uh, in your career. So hopefully your uh, tenure committee is wise to that. But um, the highly cited, so individual articles who, so we, who kind of so we blow the top because you wrote on something that was really hot. And that's something I talked about, so we explaining uh, phenomena that are really surprising. You might hit that early on with one paper where you really, wow, you explain something and so we get, uh, it blows it all the way, right? Uh, um, you know, if you... Uh, uh, have read, for example, the article, uh, and that's what we got measurement. Moore and Bedbesser, Gary Moore, he was one of my fellows, and he wrote that essentially that was his dissertation research, right? Moore and Bedbesser uh, carried in one article so uh, humongously because it was something at the time, right? Uh, so uh, that's the way it can go, but that doesn't contribute to, uh, uh, to Gary's age index because he became a CIO later, and so uh, he doesn't even care, okay? Thanks. So, uh, <laughs> I, will, I will remain where I am. I wasn't prepared to be on stage today, otherwise I would have had a proper clothing, and I spared a few of my uh, hairy legs. So I'm staying where I am. <laughs> so the and the things that and I'm the new Eric. The things that so I was like how I got network close. So uh, that was an interesting formulation, and I thought about that kind of how do I kind of respond to that. Um, I first give you a, a view how I got networked, and then I tell you how you should right? so because I think there's not, not, not a lot you can learn from my example. I grew up and was socialized in a very privileged, rich place. Right? And we talk about networking, we talk about money. Networking is a first world problem, or a first world issue. You have to be able to afford to network. If you can't afford, if you can't go to conferences, if you can't go to DCs, if you can't go to workshops, how do you network sitting at home, right? That's not possible. So you, you have to have resources in order to network. I was two months uh, in my PhD when I was kind of uh, traveling to ISIS, ICA. Well, back in, this, in that day, those days we said ISIS. Um, in 2001 in New Orleans without a paper. Uh, my research, my PhD pro uh, was funded by the US and the German National Science Foundation. 
So that was always money. Um, I've been to uh, several DCs, which is great. You should network with your peers. What you're doing here right now is the absolutely right thing. Kind of do that, take advantage, kind of connect to your peers. So you can come up to other, uh, come to other ways and other kind of forms of networking later. Um, I also have been as a visiting scholar, visiting PhD student at the University of California at Irvine in 2002 and at the University of Michigan at the I school in 2004 or 2005. Again, kind of because there was money, right? so, and, uh, and I had the freedom to do what I wanted to do. Uh, that's what I said, kind of it's, um, I may not be the right role model because I know that the situation is different in other places. And if you have to apply it at your PhD school to get funding or so, you will quick find out there is not a lot of money involved. So networking means you have to have the freedom and the resources to reach out. So what can you do? Right? So I think kind of being at a DC and trying to get to as many as possible DCs makes a lot of sense. Also, what was already mentioned was kind of being a good reviewer, right? Not just kind of uh, kick asses and, 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 and kill papers, but write constructive reviews. Will make you uh, a, a person which uh, an editor or so will recognize and will put you on the, on the positive list on, on, in, in, in your little black book, right? So somebody you can, can build upon and trust um, kind of coming up with a constructive review that helps Building up profile, building up a name in the in the in the, in the discipline, in the in the sub community to which you would like to belong to. So that's also an important part, kind of. If you are in information systems, this is a damn broad field. It's an interdisciplinary discipline. But figure out in which discipline you want to be part of and you want to be recognized. And one way of doing that is also going to pre-ICIS ICIS workshops, special interest groups. Right. This is a quite often very familiar, kind of close, like being among friends, and you're discussing the topic which is of interest, and you're kind of easily connect to all the other people in the field which work in the same area, and that is a great way kind of to go, uh, to, to, to become a, 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 a known person uh, in, in your, in your sub-community you would like to belong to. So if you're not having a paper at ICIS, go to these free events, which is always valuable, right, so to connect. So that's, that's, that's another thing. And we also have to mention paper workshopping. I'm, uh, if you're doing this, if you're asked to give a presentation on what you're working on right now or so, that's another way of kind of making yourself known, but be careful. Kind of, uh, if, you're work, if you're presenting stuff which you're working on right now, and it's a really great idea, uh, that idea may kind of easily trap right, and get out of your hands. Somebody once told me, kind of, if you have a really good idea, keep your mouth shut. That is, of course, awful. Because academia and knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination lives um, from exchanging in, a, in, a, in an environment. But you know that's the one warning here I would like to, to, to give you. But there is also more to say to that because kind of networking is is also something which takes place not in an official kind of framework like here, sitting here, listening, and sitting in, 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 in the round tables. But also networking means if you are. If you enjoy drinking, right, so uh, that helps a lot as well, right? So kind of, so the reception later today or at the bar, so I, uh, I, it is true, right, so and many people think anyway that academics are uh, heavily drinking, right, so, so live up to the stereotype and, and, uh, <laughs> and make sure that you are actually kind of approachable and network can reach out. You have to be a bit extroverted, right, so to, to network. If you are an introvert person, right, that obviously is not really helpful to, to, to build up a network. Here are kind of three warnings, right? Kind of because everybody's telling you you have to network, that's important, right? Kind of um, the one thing is up, uh, kind of up, up networking. Right? So um, I was approached many years ago by somebody who wanted to have a, wanted to meet me during the conference, and I said, yeah, let's meet kind of. No, I want to make a specific time because I'm scheduling the people I wanted to talk to. But I said, oh, I, I don't know. Right? So that, that person took it a bit too serious and had a calendar and went through the hot shots he wanted to talk to and was kind of checking the list. Right? And, and uh, people said, oh, you know, that's a bit too much. Right? So it's kind of, you can't, you can't mechanistic, mechanistically network and, and speak to people and, and sign them up. 
that's actually counterproductive. That's counterproductive. It's also kind of don't push too hard. Right? Um, I, I was organizing a lot of PhD events uh, uh, when I was an assistant professor um, and uh, went out with, with, the, with the guests uh, to uh, a little kind of tour, hiking and, and so on. And no business at all, just kind of enjoyed the, the, the countryside. And uh, at the end of the day, the person said, isn't there anything you want me to do for you? And, well, you know, well, if you ask me like that, of course, I'm going to do stuff. But uh, it didn't cross my mind that day because we just had a nice day. And then the person said, you know what, kind of ever, everywhere where I show up, kind of people have expectations to make sure that their, their paper makes it into a, into a basket jam. And I'm tackled heavily. And that's the first time you know, I haven't been tackled at all. And I said, well, you know, my view is, and of course I have, I, I want my papers also in, the, in, in my scheme now, so, right? so it's kind of, you can make it happen, perfect, right? so, of course not, right? but it's, it, my view is a different one. This is not a 100 meter race, this is a marathon. You will always come, you will bump into this person again and again and again, next 20, next 30 years. So don't, don't push too hard, don't try to squeeze something out of your contact right away, because you may burn the contact, and you will see this person again and again and again, right? So, so don't push too hard. Networking is important, but don't do it in a professional style. And then there's also a tempting thing to do in order to network and make your name kind of known in the community, but I would warn you to do that, and that is kind of too early, kind of prematurely maturing. If you as a PhD student are going to be a, a associate editor or track chair or you know you, 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 you wanted to run a conference or something like that, be careful. I would rather not encourage you to do that. And uh, I'm talking out of kind of first hand experiences. If you are not an established player in the field with tenor ideally, right? Um, and you have to reject papers of super senior people. Because the paper was rubbish. Well, well you know, this, that person isn't too happy about you rejecting his or her papers. All right? So it's kind of, it can't fire back. But you expose yourself too early, and you know, you have to make decisions which not everybody is happy about. Uh, right? So that that's so you, you because as a track chair or as, a, as an editor, um, of course, you are in an influential position, and of course, you are you, you arrived kind of as a, an accepted member of the community you wanted to be networked with, right? but you are still not 100% part of the community. So be careful. It's tempting, and sometimes it may make sense, but we have often the case that people which have no network become editors, and then they are running around and trying to find regulars because they have no network. Right, so where do the, the regulars coming from? So networking is important, but kind of <coughs> take it easy. Right? It comes naturally. Uh, don't push too hard, and uh, it is also a function of resources. You have to be able to go to these conferences. You have to be able to go to VCs and so on, uh, because you can't network sitting at home. So it is something which is, you know, it's a first world thing, as I said. And we discuss a lot of inclusion at the AIS Council. A lot of kind of people, the great people, which do not have the resources, not just PhD students, full professors, and not just somewhere in Africa, we're talking about Europe, kind of, which can't, who can't afford going to these conferences. And they can't network, and they don't have a network, so nobody's asking them to become editor or whatsoever. That is a problem. So you are already among the privileged because you are here and you can network and take advantage of that. That's more or less what I wanted to say. Kind of. As you can see, I haven't any, any, anything to write on my slides, and I'm, I'm more than happy to answer your questions if you have comments or questions, of course. Thanks a lot.
That depends a bit on what kind of interest you have. Right? Typically, I don't follow up on anything. Right? Because you're bumping into that person or the, again anyway. Right? If, you, if you discuss a paper project or so, right, then this is a different story. Mm -hmm. if, there is a, there is, if there is a reason to, to, to get back. I think, first of all, uh, many professors don't recognize faces very well, so uh, introduce yourself three times, okay? Because the first two times I may forget uh, would be one. And um, there are really uh, two types of networks. One is people whom you might want to work with and people who write you recommendations. And those are often have non-overlapping sets because people who you work with cannot write you a recommendation oftentimes. Yes. Conflict of interest. So that group of people who will write you recommendations, you may in fact from time to time send them a new paper, but not so bad, oh, another one is not too pushy, but sometimes you can uh, so you let them know of, uh, of your recent work. So, but not that it looks like, oh, I'm sending you this and half a year from now I'm going to uh, uh, ask you to, to write me that review letter. But uh, kind of just, if they are interested, let them know of your progress, especially if they may have told you before. Let me know what your progress is. Mm -hmm. If I cannot work with uh, the people that I will ask the recommendation letter, what do they recommend? Knowing you. Yeah. Knowing well, you. Well, as, as I said, kind of, you, you, you have to direct your... Okay. You, you showed up at this SIG meeting and you, so you presented something and this, these persons are always in the same room. Uh, uh, that you, there are other ways of making yourself kind of known, uh, just not, not just kind of by being, being cool that, you know, in, in a paper. So basically I, I write like, I meet you in the conference X and I know that you were presented in this uh, presentation. Would you give me a recommendation on there? Not, not if I met you only once. Okay. Right. So, I, I, for example, you're also, I mean, now you talk about recommendation for a PhD student, but we kind of when, when it comes to kind of promotion to full or so, right, you have also to write something like that. And I did this this year for a colleague. Uh, uh, we only know each other from kind of organizing events together. Or we have been at the same events and we appreciate <laughs> our own work and, and, and kind of realizing that. You know, kind of, this is a really professional person uh, without having any, any, any work relation. And I was more than happy to write this, this uh, support letter because kind of, uh, I think this is the hardworking person. So it's kind of, you, over, over the years, you, you, you have this kind of fabric of people you have around you which you never have worked with. Well, but, you know, they, you, you know each other. And you can't force that. That's what I'm saying. Don't try to force that. Because then people will shy away. Kind of, they say, oh, you know, oh, I'm going to push too hard here. Right? So it's kind of, and at the same time, make sure that you're not kind of just uh, uh, relying on the network of your supervisor. Kind of, uh, two years ago, I was here at, at AX in Kauai, actually. Kind of, somebody came over and said to my PhD students standing next to me, oh, you, know, kind of, you have to step outside of the long shadow of Roman. Right? So you don't kind of stick to him. right? And, and, and make sure that he is introducing you, kind of network yourself, and I say, oh, that's interesting advice. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's, 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 if you're always regarded, kind of perceived as, a, as an append appendix of your supervisor, that's also helpful to kind of develop your, your independent or own network. But of course, your supervisor should be the door opener as well, of course. Oh. Yeah, for, for me, I, just, I try to, you know, just looking at some of the research that I was doing, um, and I struggled through this whole process, and I just went on my own eventually and just looked at some of the research and some of the folks were doing where I was working at, and I looked them up and I sent them emails. Ms. Cutter, Dr. Cutter was one, and she was trying to give me some really good information. When I turned around and told my, showed my professor, hey, Dr. Cutter is, you know, thought my work was interesting. And then they got interested. So um, I think you have to, at some point, take a chance and just you know introduce yourself. If, if you're, because I've, I've mean several other folks. Uh, I think it was Dr. Kimber. You know, they, they don't always respond, but every you know I would I, I wouldn't. Yeah. I feel like every once in a while, like LinkedIn, like try to connect with folks on LinkedIn through other associates and maybe. I'm pretty um, sure everybody here in the room is kind of having a similar story, kind of like a kind of five kind of spontaneous kind of letters, mails, or kind of being approached on LinkedIn per week. Yeah, that's not possible. I mean, you can't, you can't, it, 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 and it's not the fact that I, I want to 
want to be impolite, or you know, you, you don't have time, and you know, and then you get something like, wow, where's this coming from, right? So and you, there's nothing you can relate or connect to this request or this this mail, right? So, but but answering the mails already is taking a lot of time out of your already kind of limited budget of time. Mm -hmm. So that, that's I would be careful. I'm not kind of somebody I've never met before, or so just sending a mail mm, would wouldn't work for me. I must say, right? So it's kind of because I get a lot of those. Oh, you're doing blockchain, and you know, I'm doing blockchain as well. Yeah, you and the one million other people. You had a question. Uh, yeah. So I have. Uh, would you put some efforts into making your social media accounts like LinkedIn? Uh, oh, that's a good question. I, I, I use LinkedIn and Twitter, that's it. I don't have Facebook. Mm -hmm. oh, well, I do have a Facebook account which I'm not using. And is it for us? Like maintaining your social well, the, the, the problem is kind of on LinkedIn, so all your students want to be friends with you. Right? And that's one of the reasons why I don't use Facebook. Because they're all working and then you have this traffic that you have to read through this thing. So, but that's against me, right? So, everybody has different ways of kind of handling this. But on LinkedIn, you get a lot of requests, kind of. On, uh, and I have a lot of, and, and I must say, kind of, if, if I have no clue where this person is coming from, I'm, I push the I push ignore button. Right? <laughs> because otherwise, you have, you have a, I have kind of 2,000 people on that on, on, on LinkedIn, right? So, I'm, you know. They know somebody who knows somebody, and then they think this is a great contact. And what's the what's the purpose of having kind of people in your network you never met before? Well, again, but that's my philosophy. Or it helps, but only when you're a bit older. Kind of, uh, I'm running a, an editorial. I have a, a column in a, in a newspaper that helps to make it with my face in the most uh, prestigious uh, finance newspaper in Denmark. And that helps a lot. Then you people on the street talk to you. I read your thing and I just agree with you. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be prepared for that. <laughs> okay, so uh, the second one is uh, during conferences. Would you advise PhD students to approach professors? Or because sometimes it feels kind of, I don't know, artificial if, if you want to, to follow some professor asking for advice and then there's a lot of PhD should. students. So it doesn't feel really natural. I, you should, I, I don't want to discourage you to, to do that, but sometimes you feel like prey. Yeah. Right? And you're like, oh, you have another question, another question. Right? So, Approach them, for sure. PhD student, yeah. Uh, but, no, for what reason? And yeah. read, read their body language, right? Yeah. If they're, they're checking their watch and they're looking around and they need to go, like, let them go. Yeah. Don't follow them to the bathroom. <laughs> don't follow them. Do not yeah. take their smile. <laughs> their friends and so on, but so everybody always for sure has a little bit of time. Clearly, uh, tell them if you're doing something interesting, tell them what you're doing, or if you read something of their work, uh, say, oh, you read that, and, and just share. And even if you say, oh, this was interesting, and why, not just kind of so big be, oh, this was interesting, but uh, uh, I think absolutely fine. Thank you. Good. I think we have to wrap it up. Uh, final question, we'll start, no? Okay. Then we'll uh, thank the panel for now. We have a few last points of order before we declare victory for now.
for now. Okay, before we go to the concluding comments, um, I wanted to make a quick round, team by team, um, because I asked each team to come up with about two insights, you know, the eye-openers, the nuggets, in Katie's words, what came out. Uh, and I'm going to be unashamedly going in reverse order, so my team goes first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm building my network. <laughs> Where it war 
works and where, and where it doesn't work. Uh, because for our research, uh, the majority of the value were in the context that we are putting behind, but actually it will improve the, the value of our research. And the second one is uh, know for whom you are creating the value and based on that select the journal. Uh, firstly, identify what, which is the community that you are serving and after that identify the, the outlets that they review. And, and part of that also is that you, if your paper gets rejected, it doesn't necessarily mean it sucks. It just could be like the wrong outlet. Yeah. Yes. For, for example, it's here. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
So you really have 4 plus 6 minus 3 is 7 years. And then depending on, of course, which school. But you have to just start a 7 year tenure program. So we, we give people a year over. Um, so start planning those seeds now. And, and these are people that are um, they're going to be your colleagues. You, you're going to see as the years go by how your careers are developing. And you're sort of all in the same boat at the moment. You have alignment of incentive. If you're after an academic career, you all need to do the same stuff. So why not collaborate? Because it, it does pay off to work together. So seek out those opportunities. Now, um, also, I would love to hear your guys' feedback. Uh, if you have waving uh, compliments, I'll take them now. <laughs> if you have suggestions how it could have been better, we'll talk at the reception in the corner. Now, <laughs> 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 well, in all seriousness, we're going to run this again next year. Uh, Tung is very passionate about the consortium, so am I. Uh, so any type of suggestion, positive, negative, uh, I have no ego in these things. So just, just tell me. Um, uh, I really appreciate uh, your feedback. So, with that said, I want to uh, thank the mentors that are still here, uh, representing all the mentors. Uh, I want to thank all of you for spending your work and putting yourself out there, because as much as it may, of course, also be fun to be here, there must also have been a moment where you said, I, I am putting my ideas here that I'm working on, that I'm passionate about, it's going to be my dissertation research, and now I'm going to hear in or out. <laughs> and it's that sort of, it's scary maybe, but you guys made it. If you wanted to know, there were, in total, there's 23 of you here. Uh, that is out of 56. So the acceptance rate is about 40, 41%. So that's pretty good. That's better than the Higgs conference. Because the Higgs conference is just over 50. So you, you really should be proud that you made it here today. And I'm very happy to uh, to mentor my teacher. With that said, let's uh, wrap it up.